Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom Number 2, Letters from Rayo Transcribers Forward When Kyle Reardon and I launched the Vanu podcast in January of this year, we took up the tough task of trying to chronicle Rayo's ideas and direct action, as well as trying to reignite life back into this very unique strategy, with little to no original source material. In the past few months, our luck has been changing. We acquired Vanu Life, March 1973, a monster of a publication, and just recently acquired a huge batch of publications from the 1960s to 1990s. Of course, not all articles or publications are by Rayo, but still highly valuable in the pursuit of Vanu. The publication you are about to read is titled Vanu, Book 2, Letters from Rayo, and is edited by Jim Stum, publisher of the now-defunct Living Free publication. I must caution you, Stum takes quite a bleak view of Wilderness Vanu in general, and levels some unfair and inaccurate attacks towards Rayo and the strategy he largely developed. That said, we are obviously extremely thankful for his work in acquiring and publishing this material. The publication you are about to read is highly unique compared to other Vanu issues we have digitized. Reason being, this one contains private letters Rayo wrote to various correspondents. We can finally dive deeply into his mind, and let me tell you, it's quite fascinating. I would speculate that one of the recipients of these letters was John Fisher, the editor of his first book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. A couple of quick notes before I turn you over to Mr. Stum and Rayo. First off, this was transcribed exactly as it is in the original publication, with any original errors in grammar or spelling left intact. Any notes, changes, or additions made by yours truly will be placed in brackets. Any errors beyond that are solely the responsibility of your humble transcriptionist. Secondly and lastly, I have made the executive decision to move the article Against Social Reformism to follow the program notes for Vanu Week, VW, and Vanu Week results. Reason being, I thought it was best to keep all of the VW material in one place, without a radical shift to philosophy in the middle. It is our goal and hope that you find this content as valuable as we do. We hope it provides you much inspiration to continue, or begin, learning how to live and let live, out of sight and mind of those unwilling to let live. Lizay Fair Shane Radliff, Liberty Under Attack and the Vanu Podcast, September 2017. The Story of Vanu Life by Jim Stum from Living Free 14, page 4, August 1981. Vanu Life was a newsletter somewhat similar to Living Free that was published from 1971 to 1974. There were 17 newsletter issues published, usually eight pages per issue, and one special handbook issue known as VL 1973. Vanu is a made-up word that means roughly free. I like to think that LF is to some extent a successor to VL, although I have made a number of changes in LF and I don't try to imitate VL exactly. For one thing, I use larger, more readable type in LF, and I think my graphics and layout are often better. As to topics covered, LF doesn't focus on living in the wilderness as much as VL did. Instead, in LF I try to cover a variety of strategies for increasing personal freedom. VL was strongly ideological and a passionate advocate of personal freedom. It was written by and for hardcore freedom seekers who want to live and let live and who want to live out of sight and mind of coercers most of the time. It was filled with discussion about going mobile and living in the wilderness as a means of hiding out from government authorities and other coercers. VL regularly printed lifestyle descriptions from various kinds of nomads, some of them people who lived in the mountains or forests more or less permanently. The moving spirit behind Vanu was a unique man who called himself Rayo. In the 1960s, Rayo was an engineer living in Los Angeles. In order to gain more freedom, he dropped out of a conventional lifestyle and moved into a camper, chassis mount on a three-quarter ton pickup. For the next couple years, he stayed around L.A., parking in what he called squat spots, places in national forests, abandoned home sites, on private land sometimes, and occasionally on city streets or parking lots. He worked infrequently as a consultant, but needed little money because he spent very little. 
Once he published an article in VL showing that he and his wife together had spent less than $1,000 in the previous year. During this time, Rayo published a Mimeo newsletter called Preform, in which he printed letters from people who live nomadic lives of one kind or another. His intention at that time was to find some other compatible nomadic people and form some kind of loose community. During the Preform years, he met the woman who became his wife. They called it a freemate relationship no civil or religious marriage. She moved into the camper with him. Later, they moved up the coast and headquartered around the California-Oregon state line. They received mail at a P.O. box in Grants Pass, Oregon for many years. In May 1971, they changed the preform newsletter into Vanu Life. VL was printed by photo offset with 50% reduction, very small type, too small in my opinion. I used 33% reduction in LF. VL also had letters from nomads and dropouts and seekers and contained more writing by Rayo. After a while, they made their headquarters in Siskiyou National Forest. They started phasing out the camper, living sometimes in a tent made from a large plastic sheet. Then they started digging an underground home on public land somewhere in the Siskiyous. After 1973, they apparently decided that publishing VL was more a hindrance than a help to them, so they turned it over to someone known as Lan and they dropped out of sight. I don't know of anyone who's heard a word from them since early 74. At least, no one is talking. The last word I've heard from Rayo was a letter he wrote to someone else dated February 14, 1974, in which he said, My thinking has undergone major changes in the last several months on interfacing, alternate economics, interrelations in general. I, too, am becoming very dubious as to the value of all libertarian club involvements. We do not intend to use the Libertarian Club in the future as an avenue for gaining non-anonymous friends or associates. Land put out the last few issues of VL, but his interest quickly faded. He dropped it, and it died. I personally met Rayo once in Oregon in 1971. He struck me as a 40-ish, Gandhi-esque looking person, skinny but physically tough and strong-willed, a very private person, almost paranoid. He also reminds me of Scott Nearing though of the opposite political persuasion. He's the sort of person who thinks problems through, makes detailed plans, then follows through with great determination. I have long admired Rayo an awful lot, and he is a major role model in my life. What does Vanu mean? By Rayo. Reprinted from Vanu Life, number one. May 1971, page one. Vanu is a coined word meaning invulnerability to coercion, coercion being physical attack by a volitional being against another volitional being or his non-coercively acquired property. I distinguish Vanu from liberty, exemption from coercion. Liberty depends on other people. It exists only to the extent that those capable of coercion abstain from it. Coercion, especially the institutionalized forms, War and regimentation is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past efforts at solution have been directed toward liberty, trying to change the behavior of large numbers of other people. There have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. You know the results. I believe that enduring peace and freedom can be realized only through Vanu, by reducing vulnerability to coercion. Vanu will most likely come gradually, primarily through lifestyle changes by individuals and small groups. But Vanu is not necessarily only for a few. Vanu will expand as far as there are people willing to do. Letter from Tom in Preform Number 1, June 1968. I am a consulting engineer, 36 years old, no family. For about eight months, I have been living full-time in a large camper. Utilities include cooking stove, floor furnace, hot water heater, shower, DC to AC converter, all self-contained. I use a trail motorcycle, which can be mounted on my back, for auxiliary transportation in wilderness areas and cities. My job assignments are temporary, lasting a few weeks to a few months. Recent work has been in Southern California. Between jobs, I usually stay at a squat spot about 80 miles from Los Angeles. For me, a nomadic association would probably be a bedroom and vacation community at first. 
I intend to continue exporting my labor for a while, topping off my savings so as to achieve a degree of financial independence. Living as a nomad, expenses are low and saving is easy. Eventually, I hope to develop a line of products which can be designed and fabricated with little or no dependence on a fixed base and marketed by mail order. Philosophically, I tend to be center libertarian, neither left nor right in the class sense, but a consistent advocate for freedom. I oppose military conscription, warfare against innocent people, taxes, bans on psychedelics, and all other interference with peaceful behavior. However, I am not a pacifist, and I will defend myself and even counterattack in a situation where this is tactically feasible and where damage will be inflicted only upon those who initiate force. I do not believe freedom is something that can be provided by society, certainly not by government. Each individual must accept responsibility for liberating himself, thus my interest in nomadic living and intentional community. So far, I have avoided family involvement because until now I could not provide what I judge to be a satisfactory environment for the growth of a child. I do not regard the existing society, with its compulsory miseducation, military conscription, and other forms of slavery directed against the young, plus the prevailing mores, as a healthy place for children. I would consider my family involvement in an intentional community where cultural independence existed and where non-state, non-coercive educational services were available. I expect to spend part of this summer working in Southern California, but hope to make one extended trip to Canada in July or August. I would enjoy meeting anyone with similar interests either in Southern California or along my route. My message service is Contact Redacted. This is an answered most days and evenings. When I am in the area, I check for messages every few days. P.S. The typewriter and mimeo machine on which I prepared this are carried on board. Letter from Rayo, February 1970. Editor's Note. I have acquired a number of previously unpublished letters from Rayo, form editor of Vanu Life, see The Story of Vanu Life in LF14. In future issues of LF, I'll publish the parts of these letters that are of general interest. These letters may be lightly edited for clarity and security, but the meaning will not be altered. J.S. Lumping in self-liberation with retreating seems to be a common error, caused no doubt by superficial similarities of techniques. While I hold that a fully liberated lifestyle must be able to cope with any likely emergency situation, and that a disaster of one kind or another is very probable sometime within the next 30 years, I don't think that the primary objective of present living is to prepare for a disaster. For more on this, see L. Ray's remarks in Autumn 69 Innovator. Most important, I reject the present and future dichotomy of retreatists, that they will continue servile living until conditions get much worse, and then, presumably, move permanently to their log cabin and watch society obligingly collapse on schedule. I have never maintained that motorized nomadism is a panacea. I did choose it for and have found it to be an excellent interim lifestyle for someone still extensively involved in the servile society through earning money, seeking a woman, etc. I have always considered dependence on state-controlled highways and gasoline to be a major shortcoming and a compromise I intend to rectify which brings me to the main subject. After much study and evaluation, my free mate and I have largely decided on a mix of troglodism, underground, and pedestrian nomadism as a fully liberated, no compromises, lifestyle, into which we will evolve. Since nomadism and troglodism integrate nicely, this will be a gradual process. We will retain our camper indefinitely, but as an accessory, secondary mobile home, to be sold or parked permanently if or when highway controls become appreciably worse. For location, we are considering areas from Southern California and Northern California to interior British Columbia. One factor affecting location choice is access to other potential free men. For personal self-satisfaction, we want to help build viable libertarian mini cultures. If liberation never gets beyond a handful of recluses hiding here and there, and libertarian philosophy died as they die, I will be disappointed. And with less capability for long-range migration and increasing unreliability and restrictions of state postal, location will be increasingly important. 
our move towards pedestrian nomadism slash troglodism is prompted in part by a feeling that we are not really free so long as we depend to any degree on legal interstices, including the state, not yet being as bad as the state could easily become. I want a lifestyle which can easily withstand the worst technocratic super-totalitarianism that is within the realm of reasonable possibility. We may still have some contact with that society, but we won't have to worry appreciably over what idiotic thing the people molesters do next, any more than somebody who takes a vacation at the Riviera now and then needs to be much concerned about the politics of France. Our change in lifestyle will be, in a sense, an answer to the omnipotence of state line of Rothbard and Hess. We will answer not in words, but by doing, the only real way. Letter from Rayo, March 1970 I strongly disagree that retreatism offers more security. Most multi-fortresses never get out of the dreaming stage because of the present and future dichotomy implicit in retreatism. Somehow, most retreatists never have enough money and time left from living it up in the present. But, assuming a retreatist does carry through and build his fortress, he still faces the prospects of long-distance travel under hazardous conditions, and he will be making formidable changes in living conditions precisely when there is no time for further learning and little margin for errors. And if, instead of an apocalypse, there is only an almost imperceptible deterioration, he will probably never bring himself to move. He will only bitch, as usual, and adjust. But I can't be very down on retreatism. Many retreatists graduate to self-liberation. For several years before opting out, I carried food supplies around in the trunk of my car, explored retreat sites, etc. What finally prompted my move was not society getting worse, but my own head getting better, disentangled from status and statist games, more and better ideas on how to liberate myself. Once a super retreatist has a fortress or two, is it rational for him to keep living in some city apartment, earning still more money to build still more vacant fortresses? For the cost of several years of middle-class existence, he can equip and fortress with almost every facility and comfort he and his harem could want. Machine shop, liquid nitrogen temperature deep freeze, huge book, record, film library, secret communication links to other fortresses, and urban contacts, etc. The person who expects to do nothing until there is an emergency, on the supposition that he can then get help from self-liberators or serious retreatists, had best have something to trade besides bullshit. And most of them won't, I suspect. We spend less time and most equivalent on repetitive and uninteresting biological requirements, obtaining, preparing food and shelter, etc., than do conventional dwellers. More time on certain tasks, but less overall. But genuine biological necessities don't consume much time anyhow. The big drains in the servile society are the status games, biological luxuries which become psychological and often political necessities. Even most traditional primitive people spend more time on status games than biological necessities, often with fatal results. Well, it might seem that one could live conventionally and yet avoid status games, this is seldom possible. The games are too interwoven with conventional society. Even if one is not incarcerated for peculiar behavior, or fired from job after job for antisocial attitudes, he incurs crushing psychological burdens, spending most of his life in contact with people and media hostile to his values. A degree of physical separation seems to be essential for liberation, as well as for long-term mental health. Certainly, it may be wise to play sheep on occasion, but those not of sheep mentality will be freer, happier, healthier, in a lifestyle where such occasions are few and far between. Notes from Rayo, November 1970 In your opposition to accepting money from the monster, are you not overlooking Parkinson's law? It is ability to collect taxes which determines total expenditures, not the other way around. My position, 
victim of robbery only has special claim to stolen property so long as he is in hot pursuit, so to speak, actively resisting, etc. Thereafter, property is morally unowned and becomes the property of any non-coercer able to take possession of it. January 1971 We plan to head south in a week or two. Expect to be back up during March and maybe April, but busy on den and difficult to communicate with. As van nomads, our lifestyle reached a peak of refinement about a year ago. For a description of a very similar lifestyle, see Further Report from a Nomad in last issue of Innovator. Now our living patterns are in transition. If you came to Grant's Pass now, we would probably meet you there, parking our camper in the backyard of a friend. We can sleep four without severe crowding, two double beds, so you could stay with us. Our main activities at the moment are catching up on mail, shopping, and camper maintenance. You might consider renting a camper or motorhome. This is off-season, so you should be able to get a good price and experimenting on your own in your area. I recommend a rig with a good propane furnace and two propane tanks for comfort. Also, make sure it has tire chains and a good jack in case it gets stuck. Have a shovel. Regarding your comments, I recommend selective access, not isolation. I suspect we have as much meaningful and useful outside communication as you do. I am impressed, though, by the fact that you have apparently remained a rational libertarian and in good health for over five years without opting out. I know very few who have done as well. Perhaps knowingly or not, you have developed psycho techniques for coping with immersion in a hostile culture. These could be of value to others. March 1971 We remain eager for contact with people into or going into lifeways compatible with our own, especially people doing it in Siskiyou region, for trading potential. In most cases, this will be people already out of servile, conventional living to at least the extent of van nomadism. In another year, when we have shelter and food securely provided, we hope to develop something to help people still in that society evaluate and gain experience and confidence at Vanu. This will probably take the form of an intensive weekend workshop session. Mostly self-doing, very little talking or watching others do. We have never claimed that our way isn't the only way to Vanu. There are many possible ways, wilderness and urban, but all require the courage, perseverance, determination, to break old habits and tolerate transient inconveniences. October 1971 I think BC Wilderness Caching Service and some associated services are potentially available, but the retreatist pitch I consider misleading. Do you really think that someone who has lived 99% of his life in populated areas can abruptly move to the wilderness and live there indefinitely, provided he has the cash that they provide? Instant liberation? A nomadic Vanuan, on the other hand, might like such a cache, not because a collapse will cut off future supplies, though it might, but because he personally doesn't want to buy and haul them. He may not have surf tags, ID, or may simply dislike visiting that society. I was a food maniac for a while last winter after eating 90% wheat and cow peas for two months, which resulted from wrong assumption on how long a certain creek would be passable. My Visit to Vanu Land in Fall 1971 by Jim Stum Now and then, people ask me what happened when I visited Tom and Roberta in Oregon in 1971. Twice I've written an account of my visit in private letters, but I've been reluctant to tell the story in print in the past for reasons that have mostly faded away by now, so the time has come to tell all. I was corresponding with R. L. Gifford during 1971. He wrote in LC and VL using the pen name of Orion. Gifford was living in Oregon, camping out at Jack's Place, in contact with Tom and Roberta, having been hired by them to pick up their mail from their P.O. box in Grants Pass. G. was encouraging me to come out, painting a rosy picture of an embryonic, vanuist community there with great potential for growth. I was ready to make a change anyway, and in September 71, after quitting my bank job in Buffalo, I drove to Oregon, intending to stay. The final push that led me to make my move at that time was Nixon imposing wage and price controls on 15th of August, 71. 
In my apocalyptic state of mind at that time, I decided that that foreshadowed the beginning of the end politically, and it was time for me to go underground. What better place to do it than with Tom in Oregon? My car was a little 1967 Toyota four-door that I had modified by taking out the back of the back seat and installing a board so I could sleep in back with my feet sticking into the trunk. Even so, my body just barely fit. I drove out from Buffalo to Oregon in four days and back in five, driving alone up to 700 miles a day, sleeping every night in my car. G had sent me directions to a squat spot outside Grant's Pass where I was to meet him the spot designated Grant's Pass in E7, described in VL2, page 8. I found it at dusk on the fourth day of my trip and settled down there for the night. Next day, I went into Grant's Pass to announce my arrival. I wrote a postcard address to the Vanu P.O. box and dropped it in a mailbox. Then I went looking for the GP mail drop, which I found easily. A five-gallon Olympic paint can in a pile of rubbish behind a garage on an alley at a certain address. I left a second message in the drop and returned to my squat spot to await contact, feeling deliciously conspiratorial as you can imagine. G showed up later that afternoon, having picked up my message in the drop. We drove to Jack's place in my car. G had no car, rode a bicycle. As soon as I begin to learn details about the situation there, I begin to find it much less attractive than I had imagined it would be. In his letters, G had tended to exaggerate. In his youthful enthusiasm, he was about 20 then, I was 27. E.G. Jack's place. In his letters, G. told me this guy Jack, who lived in California, had bought some land way back in the woods in Oregon, near Grant's Pass, and was building a house there. G. was camping out there, at the half-finished house, doing some painting or something for Jack, who wasn't in residence while I was there. Before driving out, I had it in my mind that I might camp out at Jack's place for a while, maybe even until spring until I became familiar with the area. Upon arrival at Jack's place, I found it very different from what I had imagined. I suppose it looked like way back in the woods to G, a city boy from New Jersey, but not to me. I'm a city boy myself, but I have spent a lot of time in the Adirondack Mountains of New York State, once hiking alone for three days without seeing another human being. Jack's place looked to me like outer suburbs, thin second growth woods. Apparently Jack had purchased about five acres from some farmer, and the access road that dead-ended at Jack's house passed right by the farmer's front porch, which was maybe a quarter mile from Jack's house. So the farmer had full view of all comings and goings. It wasn't at all the secluded place I was looking for. I told G that I would like to meet Rayo, and he went off to make arrangements while I set up camp up the hill from Jack's house. I was using a small canvas pup tent and a thin rectangular sleeping bag. I had a good one-burner gasoline stove for cooking, but I hadn't yet discovered the quick way to light it on a cold morning. My camping gear was inadequate for cold weather camping, and the nights were already starting to get cold. That evening, as G and I sat around a campfire eating popcorn, G told me that a meeting with Rayo was set for the next day, Sunday. We would be driven to where Rayo was staying by a guy in the real estate business who was a friend of Rayo's. Then, so I wouldn't be surprised and confused, G went on to tell me that I hadn't known before then that Rayo and Tom were one and the same person. I was going to meet Rayo, and the real estate guy always called him Tom. That meant Rayo's free mate, wife, Dr. Naomi Gatherer, was Roberta. I had also learned then that Roberta sometimes used the pen name Halen Hygieia. So I had been expecting to find a somewhat loosely associated Vanu community consisting of at least six people Gifford, Tom, Roberta, Rayo, Gatherer, and Halen. Turned out there were three people and some pen names. That put G's claims about a Vanuist community in a different, less favorable light. Next day, I walked with G across fields and through woods to the real estate guy's house, and he drove us to some rural land he owned where Tom was staying. He drove by a roundabout route, it seemed, so I wouldn't learn the way. Very James Bondish, but wasted on me. I wasn't making mental notes. I believe this was a place where Tom stored stuff in five-gallon cans stashed in the woods, and he was there temporarily sorting through his stuff. It was a nice meadow, near woods, with a stream down the hill and a long view off down a valley. No houses in sight. Dead-end dirt road led to the meadow. We spent the afternoon sitting in a circle near Tom's camper, 
on overturned five-gallon cans, munching on walnuts and talking. I've forgotten what we talked about. My overall impression of Tom was favorable. He appeared forty-ish, skinny, but tough, Gandhi-esque looking. Strong-willed, kind of a suspicious guy. No one would call him warm and friendly, but could rely on him to fulfill any contract or promise he had made. But I knew most of that from his writing. He was, however, something less than the libertarian hero I had built him up to be in my mind, and I was beginning to have doubts about his Vanu strategy. For one thing, he was dead set against owning land, but here he was using land owned by someone else to store his supplies, depending on favors from his friends to make up deficiencies in his own program, it seemed to me. Roberta was a big, strong woman, overweight, though not grossly fat, and hairy, kind of masculine. I went along with her when she went down a trail through the woods to get water from the stream. She filled two five-gallon jerry cans, must have weighed at least 40 pounds each. I wondered to myself, now how is she going to get those up the hill to the camper? I decided I would make myself useful and carry one of them for her. But before I could make a move, she suddenly grabbed them by the handles on top, picking up both, one in each hand, and marching off up the trail. I stood staring after her as she disappeared around a bend in the trail, astonished at this feat of strength that I don't think I could have managed. It was just her normal daily routine, I gather. Before dark, G and I returned to Jack's house. Next day, I took my car into Grant's Pass to have the blown muffler replaced. It had blown in the Midwest where Toyota dealers were then as scarce as fish feathers, so I drove it, noisy as it was, out to Oregon. That afternoon, or maybe it was the next day, Tom and Roberta drove the camper over to Jack's place. As they drove in, they had a small accident that made a big impression on me. The camper had a glass door on the back like a patio door. They carried a small trail bike outside strapped on the back. As Tom drove up the washboard road, the camper started bouncing. Before he could get it to stop, the trail bike had slammed against the glass back of the camper a couple times and cracked it. When that happened, the thought occurred to me that now Tom will have to go back into that society to get a replacement for the glass, and it struck me as more than an isolated problem. It was also an exemplar of a fundamental defect of his Vanu strategy. He claimed to be free of that society in some sense, and yet, at any moment, an unexpected event like this might require him to go back into that society for repairs or spare parts if he wasn't to suffer a decline in his way of living. He depended on that society utterly for equipment in general and for most of what he consumed. He was living on the fringe of that society rather than actually out of it, and only the sufferance of government allowed him to get away with it. A more authoritarian government could have snared him easily, e.g. simply by putting up roadblocks and questioning everyone who came through. Where do you live? Where do you work? Etc. From that moment, the Vanu idea seemed a whole lot less effective than I had believed. But to this day, I remain convinced that camper nomadism is a way to live in reasonable comfort inexpensively, say on $2,000 a year or less today. So living that way would give you a lot of freedom, not from the state, but from obnoxious employers. Such a low income would also free you from paying income tax and reduce what you pay in sales tax. And if you spend a lot of time out of sight in the wilderness, you can ignore a lot of annoying regulations. But it will not make you invulnerable to coercion. That overstates it. And if you get rid of the camper and move into a tent to increase freedom by getting off the roads and doing away with the need for driver's license and vehicle registration, that would reduce your comfort levels below what I would find acceptable on a permanent basis. Another thing I noticed was that Tom and Roberta seemed to form a tight, closed society between the two of them, with not much need for outsiders, hard for any third person to get close to them, more so than other married couples I have known. G was less close to them than he had led me to believe, not Tom's right-hand man as I had gathered, and it seemed like G could flit off to anywhere at any moment. He did, in fact, leave for New Jersey a few weeks later, and he never returned to Oregon, although my leaving may have influenced him in that. I saw no evidence that any other persons were likely to join the Vanu community. So where did that leave me, I wondered. Pretty much on my own, if I stayed in Oregon. And I had to do something fast. It was almost October, winter coming, nights were already cold, and I could see that my camping gear wasn't adequate for winter camping. That would have been an easily solved problem. I had money, 
cash, traveler's checks, and a stash of gold coins wired up under the front seat of my car, but it was one more thing to deal with. I had to get settled into some place for the winter. Not Jack's place, which I didn't like, or if I was going to leave, I had to get over the mountains to the east before snow started falling in the high passes, so I had to decide. Overall, finally, Tom and Roberta struck me as quite nice people, like a friendly rural couple, a little shabby looking, the sort you'd find on a remote homestead somewhere and be happy to have for neighbors. But I had been expecting much more. They fell far short of the superhuman, libertarian heroes I was expecting. There didn't really seem to be any room for me in their little community, us against the world. It wasn't likely anyone else would join us, and G would probably leave. So I decided I might as well go back east. If I was going to be pretty much alone anyway, I might as well make my base on familiar territory, where I had relatives and some other friends I could possibly call on if needed. I had pretty much made that decision before that evening when the four of us spent some time sitting around the table in the camper. We spoke in general terms as if we were going to be staying near each other for a while. I didn't want to say that I had decided to leave. I didn't actually say that I was planning to stay either, although I let that impression stand. I didn't commit myself to anything in particular, and no one pressed me to say what my plans were. I don't know what I would have said if they did. I felt I was being a little deceptive, and that made me uncomfortable. But I was loath to get into an argument with Tom by mentioning the shortcomings I saw in his Vanu ideas. I still had a high regard for Tom, and I was somewhat intimidated by him, even though he was not quite the hero I had thought he was, and I knew this evening would probably be the last time I ever saw him. I didn't want to end up in bickering disagreement. So we had a friendly talk, and I was careful not to promise anything that I wasn't about to fulfill. Later in the dark, I went back up the hill to my tent. Next morning early, I packed up and left to drive back east without saying goodbye to anyone. I left a brief note at my campsite saying I was leaving. Later I wrote to Tom and expressed my doubts about the Vanu strategy in writing. My leaving was partly a failure of nerve on my part, but it was also a reasonable practical decision. What I found was quite different from my expectations, partially because my expectations were unrealistic, partially because I was misinformed by G. I was under pressure to do something fast because winter was roaring down on me. It would have been different if I had come out earlier in the year, in early summer. Then I could have hung around, camping out here and there in the west for a few weeks and maybe I would have decided to stay anyway, despite my disillusionment with the Vanu folk. But then I would have missed interesting experiences that I had over the next few years in co-ops in Buffalo. It's impossible to know what might have happened if I stayed in the west, the road not taken. Letter from Rayo, November 1971 your info concerning us being around Grant's Pass a great deal is out of date. A couple of times since we moved to Siskiyou, we lived in the camper in or near GP for several weeks at a stretch, but we haven't done that since last January and don't intend to again. During periods when I am processing mail, Orion did it during August, I hike and ride on a motorbike to GP every week to 10 days. This is a fairly long hike ride totaling about three hours one way. During short days of autumn and winter, I barely have time to go, process mail, send out initial copies to new subs on the spot, do half a dozen shopping errands, and get back in daylight. If something delays me and I don't start back until dark, the return trip takes about twice as long, since I must go much slower for part of the way. I dislike laying over at GP, since this means packing along sleeping gear in cold weather. I have intended to scout out and set up an overnight camp stash near GP, but haven't gotten around to it. I now find a visit to GP, or any town of that society, to be rather unpleasant. It's the massive impact of values of that society, I think, values I find distasteful. This represents a change for me from a couple years ago, when I rather looked forward to occasional visits. Orion was recently hassled three times during one three-day stay in and around GP. When we do meet people in and near GP, this tends to misrepresent our lifestyle. Recently, we did visit with someone near GP. 
This was a would-be immigrant anxious to meet us. To do this, we lived in the camper for several days, parking it on relatively unsecluded private land with permission of owner. After a day, the would-be immigrant left as precipitously as he came, cold feet literally, I think. He was tent camping, apparently for the first time in his life. In a subsequent letter, he said he was rather disappointed with our lifestyle. It didn't seem very Vanu, especially our dependence on private land. Also, my visits to GP are unscheduled, especially in autumn, winter, and spring. I don't relish riding the motorbike in rain and snow. So these are all reasons why we do not wish to meet somebody around GP. Now that we are at our winter base camp, we are able to better meet with people. We will meet them at a vehicle squat spot, which is several miles from our base camp. The squat spot is roughly 50 miles from GP on all weather roads, gravel part of the way. The squat spot is accessible for the average auto in all but the worst weather. The visitor must bring his own shelter. Upon arriving, he hikes to a particular tree about a half mile away from the squat spot, which we use as a signal flagpole. He puts a combination of flags on the rope and runs them up to announce his presence. About once a day, we climb to a peak near our camp from where we can see the flags with the telescope. One of us, or more, but only one at a time, then go on foot to visit him at the squat spot. We do not have visitors at our base camp. If we should be out of the area for more than a day, unlikely in winter, we leave a message at a guest message drop near the squat spot. All factors considered, I think that a visit is worthwhile only for someone who is squatting in the area for other reasons, such as a prospective immigrant who is scouting the area. Most Vanuists and Libertarians, I find, are not nearly as interesting in person during a first visit as in letters and articles. This is true of myself, I think. First meetings tend to be consumed talking superficially about a lot of things. There's little depth. I certainly recommend that possibilities for communication by mail be exhausted before considering a visit, including such things as cipher messages and tape recordings. Comments on previous letter. The would-be immigrant Rayo mentions here in the last letter was me. I visited him, his freemate, and Orion in September 1971, intending to move to that area. But I found the situation there to be not at all that appealing to me, so I returned to New York. Here's the paragraph from my October 71 later to Rayo in which I mention private land. Having seen your lifestyle up close, I now have my doubts as to how invulnerable you really are to state coercion. You generally oppose buying land because this makes the buyer subject to property taxes and various restrictions. Yet you use private land owned by others. Also, if you make a camper your home, you still need a state driver's license and vehicle registration, and you have to comply with the state regulations concerning RV design. It seems to me that if the state takes the easy course of just shearing the sheep, then you won't need so much seclusion and abandonment of technology to be reasonably free. On the other hand, if the state really tries to root out every resistor, even Vanuans likely won't escape their net. The trouble is, you are not a separate and independent society. You have to import food, fuel, and spare parts from the coercive society and export labor to make a living and your communications are mainly through the state's mail system. This leaves you highly vulnerable through your supply lines. Long-term storage helps with this problem, but the only real solution is to produce everything that you need. I suppose that you hope to progress in this direction, but I don't see how you can do much without more people, and I don't see how you can attract more people without being able to offer more independence of status servile society more than a backwoods man type standard of living, and more of a real community of Vanuans. Each seems to require the other as a prerequisite. It's a dilemma. As for my camping experience, I had done some camping before in the Adirondack Mountains, but not much. My camping gear was inadequate, small pup tent, too thin a sleeping bag. I recall one morning out there sitting in the sun for a while warming my chilled bones, but that's all minor stuff. I could easily have bought better gear if I had decided to stay. Of greater concern, I had been led to expect, by Orion, not Rayo, that there was an embryonic Vanu community in Siskiyou. 
I found no such thing, only three people, and one of them, Orion, was a butterfly who could flit off at any moment, and he did, in fact, leave for the East Coast a couple weeks later. Rayo is also referring to me when he says in Vanu Life 5, page 1, Warm Bodies. One visitor came expecting to count a large number of them and was disappointed because he couldn't. Rayo goes on there to say that most contributors to VL are scattered over a wide area and are in contact with each other only by mail. My judgment then was that Wilderness Vanu was too rough a lifestyle to ever attract many people to it, so the prospects of a Vanu community developing were slim. Time has proved that prediction correct. Since my main reason for moving to Oregon was to live in physical contact rather than male contact with like-thinking people, when I found that wouldn't be possible, there was no good reason for me to stay there. Western New York, on the other hand, at least was familiar turf, where I knew my way around and had relatives and other useful contacts. Reconsidering now returning east still seems to have been a correct decision, especially considering that Wilderness Vanu never went anywhere. My only doubt is, I wonder if anything would have changed if I had stayed. Perhaps Orion would not have left. Perhaps other people would have joined us after all. But then, if I had stayed in the West, I wouldn't have taken part in founding North Buffalo Food Co-op, and I would have missed the rewarding experience I call my summer at Fred's Farm, and half a dozen fine people I hung out with for a while. Interesting. Letter from Rayo, November 1971. Since you and or CS are apparently uninterested in camping out in the Siskiyous for several days, and we are uninterested in hanging around my town, I suggest an alternative, tape recordings. Rather than simply letter on tape monologues, since two or more of us can get together at each end, we can experiment with livelier formats, some possibilities. Conversations between H and I and whoever else is around. Orion is headed east for a while to pick up some possessions and perhaps export some labor on one end and between you and C and someone else on the other. Talk would be about what we have recently done, are doing, etc., or whatever comes to mind, or on specific topics requested. Question and answer with critical cross-examination. E.g., you direct questions at me and request that H attempt to act as your agent in cross-examining, asking further questions, giving contrary interpretations, etc. In this case, what she said would not necessarily represent her own attitudes and views, and she would include a disclaimer to that effect. Of course, H would not necessarily ask the same follow-on questions you might, but as she got to know you and your interests and attitudes closer and closer, she could do better and better. Then you would direct questions at H and ask me to cross-examine, etc. Tape recorder left running while certain types of activities were in progress. Cooking and eating, erecting tent, making BCW caches, etc. During this time, we would attempt to ignore the recording and act as usual. At first, we probably wouldn't succeed, but our or your behavior would be no more, probably less, untypical than during a physical visit. Before each tape was sent, the persons making it would listen to it and dub in comments about what was going on, what background noise was, etc. Also erase anything not for the ears of a possible postal inspector, until such time as a scrambler was added. This last mode would be very limited for us at present, since the only recorder we have at present requires 60 cycle, 110 volt electricity which requires an inverter, which we only have at the camper. However, we expect to have electricity at our camp, from storage batteries and engine generator to recharge, before winter is over. And or, we will procure battery-powered recorder if the recording exchanges proves beneficial. If it works well between you and us, we would suggest it to others. Recordings can be supplemented with pictures of foam huts, wilderness sites, etc., not people preferably taken with Polaroid, which we don't have but would also procure if it seemed worthwhile. Subject matter would be limited until audio scramblers could be added. These would ideally be of such a type that message would sound through non-descrambling player simply as background noise, poor quality tape, 
then the music would be recorded over it. Upon descrambling the message, we would come clear and music would be noise. Although this depends on PO or other means of physical delivery, economy, and reliable range are much greater than any radio approach. Yes, hams occasionally talk to people across the continent and even around the world, but very occasionally. Weather conditions might be just right. Or hams can relay messages from one to the next, but that's involved. I have never been a ham. Becoming and remaining one involves contact with bludge. I think there are possibly services which could be beneficially provided by any Vanuans and Libs already into it, but I don't think it's worth going into. I'm very interested in and have ideas for undetectable radio equipment. It is not especially difficult to do, but a transceiver with a 20 to 30 mile range might cost $200. That's a 1971 price, JS, in production quantities of 100. And marketing would have to be Vanu, unlike audio scramblers, which so far as I know, are not illegal yet. I had a preliminary design and was thinking about building two prototypes six years ago. I tried crypto strips as a test of the market and reception was Luke cool, so I shelved the idea. Market may be bigger now, since more freedomists are moving beyond bullshit, but not yet big enough, I think. But considering only equipment on the market right now, one can buy a tape recorder, Polaroid camera, perhaps a tape duplicator or second recorder, and quite a few other goodies for the cost of one or two physical trips. I don't recommend you buy a recorder, if you don't already have one, just for this purpose. If this works out, we will probably switch to cassette tapes, which records at slower speed and which uses less tape, but chances are that some acquaintance has a recorder which you can borrow for a few test exchanges. Our tape recorder is the conventional reel variety, monaural, three and three quarters, or seven and a half inches per second. So if you want, give it a try. Vanuans and applied libs talk much about the desirability of technology and about the pitfalls of primitivism, and yet still rely on that most primitive means of personal contact. Physical visitation will be obsolete for all forms of association except sexual relations and a few personal services. This will require an undetectable radio net, of course. Comments on Rayo's letter. Rayo's correspondent tells me that this tape exchange idea was never tried. Today a videotape correspondence would be possible, adding movie pictures to sound. But Rayo, I suppose, would see to it that no persons or at least no faces were visible. It seems to me there's some merit in the idea of a group conversing with another group via tape. The main benefit is that you can speak many more words than you can write or even type with the same amount of time and effort. Also, sound can carry more info because you can hear tones of voice, emphasis, etc. There is also the possibility of conveying sounds other than words on tape, such as music and sounds of animals and machinery, but it's not immediately apparent what use that capability would be in a private correspondence. Disadvantages 1. Privately made tapes are often undecipherable in spots because of background noise or because voices are too muffled. This could be a problem especially when recording a group sitting at various distances from the microphone. 2. Some people are nervous in front of a microphone, stage fright, but I guess you'd soon get over that. 3. A tape is much harder to edit than writing on paper. 4. Similarly, it's much harder to find something on tape compared to paper if you want to refer back to it because you can't skim through a tape as you can through writing. 5. Tape correspondence is much more expensive than paper and pencil. Rayo's third suggestion, to let the tape run to record domestic activities is, in my opinion, really worthless. All you'd get would be a lot of meaningless sounds, mostly incomprehensible and of no value to the listener. A more useful idea is to make a tape as if you were making a radio documentary. You start by writing a script, at least in rough outline. You need a narrator to paint word pictures to replace the missing visual aspect. Example, you could tape a tour through your camp or homestead, describing each point of interest as you come to it. And on the left there, we have the outhouse. This is so high, so wide, and smells like. You get the idea. 
You could also describe activities and interview people you meet accidentally on your tour. Even richer possibilities are available if you use a video cassette camera. The point of all this was that Rayo was suggesting a tape correspondence as a substitute for physical visits. He was missing the point about what physical contact is for. It's much more than just a means of communicating specific bits of info. It's clear that Rayo wasn't one for visiting just for the enjoyment of good fellowship, to say nothing of partying. Rayo's comment, eventually physical visitation will be obsolete, reveals only his own extreme social isolation and should not be taken seriously as a prediction for a world anything like what presently exists. Humans are social animals. That's coded into our genetic structure. The rare exceptions might turn up who are content to be hermits or say they are, though I wonder. One of the failings of Rayo's Vanu lifestyle was that it didn't allow for a sufficient development of social components. I think a person can get along perfectly well without contact with masses of other people, but most people need to be part of at least a small group of maybe 10 to 15 people. Rayo's two-person Vanu society was much too small. Vanu Week, 1972 the following ad appeared in Vanu Life 6, March 1972. Live and learn wilderness Vanu living for six days in Siskiyou region this summer. We will show you how, help you, scout site, erect shelter, finesse trails, forage wild foods, eat inexpensive whole grains, cook invisibly, store supplies, cash valuables. 15 hours personal instruction, demonstration, assistance. We furnish. Campsite, tent, mosquito bar, ground pad, cooking gear, food, mostly wheat, beans, rice, lamp, saws, books, maps, and catalogs from our library, you bring, clothes, bedding, any personal items such as snake bite kit, camera, binoculars, firearms, extras we can furnish, extra charge, bedding, local transportation, Vehicle parking. Help setting up permanent shelter. Your campsite will be in forested, low mountain area, swimming hole in a clear creek less than half mile away, moderately secluded, over a mile from nearest settlement. We are still learning too, but maybe we can advance you in your quest. One or two people, $40. Additional people in groups, $10 each. Additional days, $1 per person. Sorry, no animals. 20% deposit. Say when and how you will arrive at least a month in advance. We'll send directions to the meeting place. The following letters were sent to the first Vanu Week customer, not to me. Letter from Rayo, April 16, 1972. Thank you for your reservation for Vanu Week and $10 deposit. May 30th or 31st is fine. Please set exact time and day for your meeting if possible, so that you don't have a long wait. Any time is okay with us, but meeting place will be easier for you to locate in daylight. Since I haven't seen you for several years, please also provide identifying information, such as colors of shirt, pants, vehicle, which can be seen from a distance. Enclosed is a preliminary description, also directions to meeting place. Within a week or so, you should also receive further information about Rialtaville, which you ought to have. Consider the typical program to be illustrative only. Look at it, then tell us what you want. Let us know you and your companions' relative interest in seclusion, comfort, vehicle access, how far are you willing to hike, access to swimming hole big enough to actually swim in, not just dip in, weather is often very hot in June, 90 to 100 degree highs, distant scenery, view, nearby terrain, some fairly level, grassy areas rather than all trees or brush, foraging wild plants, berries probably won't be ripe, hunting and trapping, we are not yet very proficient at this, sad to confess, but I had two mice for breakfast, along with a pot of sprouted wheat and beans. A year ago, my reaction was ick when I had to move one from a trap, showing that attitudes can do or change. Coaching valuables, stashing bulky commodities, Self-mobile human shelter, base camp. Relatively stationary human shelter, smial, shiswap. 
import-export techniques applicable to northwest coast rainforests, techniques applicable to interior, techniques useful mainly for summer, techniques useful for the year around, foods you dislike, etc. Will female companion be free mate or potential free mate? How important is comfort and recreation potential for her? Is one tent, one double bed foundation adequate? Of course you can tell us what you want when you arrive, but we can prepare and do a better job if we know in advance. The area I have in mind for Vanu Week is accessible, only a few miles access road unpaved, but not especially secluded. While we have never been molested camping there, several months total at various times, several vehicles per day drive through. Also, distant highway noises are audible, which might be disconcerting for someone, companion, who might subsequently equate Vanu with absence of man sounds. So let us know how far you prefer to hike, especially on rocky, brushy terrain without a trail. We would like to wrap with you about strategy, BC versus Siskiyou in general, etc. And if you would also, don't consider this to be part of the 15 hours. Possible hazards, poison oak, ticks, rattlesnakes. The four ticks which have so far managed to bite us apparently didn't transmit any disease. We have seen, throughout Siskiyou in two years, four rattlesnakes killed to 8-1. Later letter from Rayo about Vanu Week. Consider the availability of the camper embedding to be a first customer discount. We will be identifying and correcting problems in our proceedings. Two other people have made deposits, but won't be coming until August. I request that L, or whoever, have a fairly good understanding of our motives and goals, Vanuism, before arriving. If she reads the first six issues of Vanu Life before coming and discusses it with you on the way, this should be sufficient. I will assume that whoever comes understands in general what we are talking about. If she doesn't, she will think we are very weird people, and indirectly you must be weird for wanting to come, etc. Also, I will assume she is discreet, regardless of the particulars of her philosophy. Food we provide will be mostly vegetable. We are not as much into hunting as trapping as we would like to be and intend to be in another year. If you have time, you might try to visit RP near Eugene. He has lived around rural areas of the region for 50 years. But unless you contemplate moving to Siskiyou, you might do better to get further advice from someone in the locale of interest to you, since possibilities vary considerably from area to area. Since you didn't specify miles to base camp, I am picking a fairly accessible spot, about half mile from camper, or one mile from original meeting place. But you will be near the edge of a large wilderness, relatively, and can hike in as far as you want. Vanu Week, Preliminary Description, April 1972, by Tom and Roberta. Introduction. Vanu Week provides a sample of our present way of life and 15 hours instruction in our techniques. We are living in a low mountain area of the Siskiyou region. Winters are long and wet, but mild, mostly rain, little snow. Summers are hot and dry, but there are many creeks that flow year round. Many of our techniques, especially for shelter, are useful only in this climate. They would not be suitable in desert, Arctic, or regions of heavy snowfall, including Northeast and North Central US. Our present shelter and techniques, as of April 1972, after a year and a half of experimentation and development, is adequate or better from April through November, marginal from December through March. When daytime temperatures are below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is often the case in winter, we are comfortable lounging in bed, on one hand, or doing strenuous work, on the other, but not when doing light work that requires standing or sitting. Our highest priority right now is further development of a shelter and by next winter, we expect to have adequate year-round shelter. However, during Vanu week, we will demonstrate present, not anticipated, methods, since new approaches invariably have problems that are discovered and corrected only through experience. Emphasis We are living almost full-time in the wilderness, not merely surviving until we can return to civilization. Our objective is not maximum self-sufficiency as such, but maximum vanu, invulnerability to coercion, with comfort. We use whatever mix of imports and native materials will yield maximum vanu 
given our present skills and numbers. We admire any survivalists who are able to walk naked into the wilderness and obtain all food, shelter, and tools strictly from what they find there, and we are eager to learn from them. But very few, if any, survivalists live that way all the time. Most do it for a couple of weeks and then return to their city abodes. While most of our tools and supplies still come from that society, we spend little time there, including time spent earning money to buy supplies, much less time than most survivalists. Gradually, we are increasing our foraging abilities and reducing our use of imports, but always striving for maximum vanu, with comfort, overall. All our essential imports are stored for a year or more, so in event of some catastrophe, we will have additional time to learn to do without. Environment The immediate area is moderately secluded, a mile or more from the nearest settlement. Some land is unowned, some is private but little used. During summer, an average of two vehicles per day pass through on a dirt road, and there are a few unofficial picnic spots along this road that are occasionally occupied on weekends. There is little evidence of people away from the road and Major Creek. Within one day hiking distance are many square miles of much more secluded land. In the creeks there is at least one nice swimming hole, many places deep enough to take a bath or cool off. Within a hundred mile radius there are elevations from sea level to over 8,000 feet, areas of heavy timber, areas of scrub timber and brush, old mines and placers, rainforest to semi-desert. During June through September, the weather is mostly hot and sunny. However, the rare rainy spells can last a week or longer, so anyone not limited by weight might bring a rain suit. There are a few mosquitoes in spring. Small biting flies spring through fall, but not in large quantity in most areas. There is poison oak in many areas. For summer, we like long-sleeved nylon dress shirts. Fairly cool. Stops most insects. Easy to wash and dry. Doesn't mildew if left wet. Program Our instruction is personalized. We will show you how and help you do whatever you want to the best of our ability. We can do this best if you let us know in advance what your interests are. A typical Vanu week might include Day 1 Your drive or hitchhike or bus and hike to the meeting place. One of us meets you there at noon. We hike about two miles to a campsite I have already scouted. On the way, I point out features of interest, edible plants, etc. You pack any personal gear you have brought. I pack food and camp gear. We clear spot, erect tent, polyethylene A tent, about 25 by 8 by 7 feet. Make trail to water source, prepare bed foundation. I cook boiled whole kernel wheat and beans on a propane camp stove. There is also sprouts and or wild greens. I put food to soak for tomorrow. I leave you about 6 p.m. Day 2. Morning. You relax, read, or explore immediate area. I come at about 2 p.m. bringing remainder of food supplies in drum. We gather wild edibles in season. We grind grain for bread and chapitas. We put a fire tarp for wood stove. We wrap about food, procurement, storage, preparation. At dusk, we cook dinner on wood fire. Day 3. You are alone to explore, forage, swim, read, relax, think. Day 4. I come about 10 a.m. We camouflage tent. We bury a five-gallon can of pretend valuables. We prepare inconspicuous trail through heavy brush area. I show or describe footgear that doesn't mar the turf, electric fence, warning systems. We rap about concealment. Day 5. You are alone. Day 6. I come about noon. General rap about Siskiyou region. Types of shelter. Lifestyles. Elaboration on subjects of special interests. I means Tom or Roberta, usually alternating. Groups. At present, we can provide shelter for up to three groups, six people total, at one time. For learning, a group size of one or two may be optimum. In larger groups, a pecking order sometimes develops with one or two people doing and the rest just watching or goofing. A large group should consider splitting up for most of the week, then coming together toward the end. Children. Accompanied children are welcome but are sometimes a distraction for their custodians. 
you know best about yours. Unaccompanied children are welcome only if 1. Weaned and housebroken. 2. Come at their wish. 3. Are self-responsible enough not to hurt themselves with ordinary utensils, tools, matches, etc. We will provide additional caretaking upon request of a client. For example, stay overnight with a lone child who is afraid of the night sounds, but reserve the right to reduce instruction one hour for each five hours of such caretaking. With any client, we will only advise, not command, unless his actions endanger us or our property. For example, if a child wishes to climb a mountain for which he is not equipped and does not want one of us to accompany him, we will advise him against it, but not stop him. We are not responsible for injuries. We will give warnings of likely dangers in the area and attempt to render first aid in event of injury. Hazards in the immediate area are no greater than around a conventional home, perhaps less. There are rocks in a few cliffs, but no stairs or roofs, creeks, but no streets or bathtubs, a few rattlesnakes and coyotes, who usually avoid people, but no dogs or child molesters, poison oak, but no sugar-coated pills or airplane glue. We have no children of our own, but have caretaken children from age three and up. No animals. Food. Unless you have special diet problems, we suggest that during Vanu week, you consume only food that we provide or that you forage to discover and cure any problems you may have eating mostly grains and legumes. We will also provide small quantities of storable goodies and demonstrate some cake and candy substitutes. Getting together. The meeting place will be less than 10 miles from a paved highway on which there is at least daily bus service. An average auto can be driven to the meeting place in most weather. When you send deposit, please tell us expected date and time of arrival, number of people in groups, approximate ages, means of identifying you, particular interests, special services needed. We receive mail about once a month. We have no phone. We will then send you directions to meeting place. We will also send a duplicate to your name, care of General Delivery, Grants Pass, Oregon, if we believe it is likely that you will have left home before we reply. One of us will check at meeting place from one half hour before until one half hour after the time you set for meeting, daylight hours only. If you do not arrive within a half hour after the time you set, you will be instructed to erect a flag on top of a nearby hill. We will check every couple of days for a week or so. If I was bringing a vehicle that isn't especially attractive to vandals or valuable, I would probably leave it parked near the meeting place for the week. If you do this, the risk is yours. We will caretake a vehicle for a week for $2 plus $1 per $1,000 value. It will not be accessible. For pickup and delivery, one small person, motorbike, person plus luggage, 150 pound maximum, Cave Junction, $5. Grants Pass or Medford Airport, $15. Two or more people, 1,500 pound maximum. Cave Junction, $10. Grants Pass or Medford Airport, $30. There is also a light plane airport between Cave Junction and O'Brien. Sorry, but at present we cannot offer Vanu Week on an apprentice basis where you pay through work done for us. Perhaps in another year we will have enough easily contracted out work for this to be possible. Program Notes for Vanu Week, Day 1, by Rayo. Transcriber's Note I have decided to scan the outlines Rayo put together. I had trouble formatting it correctly, and plus, there are images and diagrams that need to be added. Editor's Note Roger Kenmore, Living Free 28, page 4, supplied a copy of what appeared to be lecture notes that Rayo used for his Days 1 and 4 presentations during Vanu Week. These notes are sketchy, but they contain much valuable information. Here are the notes for day one. 1. Ground cover. Consider various types of terrain, geology, vegetation. Each has advantages indicated below by plus and disadvantages indicated by minus. A. Heavy timber, uncut. Plus. Good air cover. Minus. No vehicle squat spots. Minus few edibles and little game, minus, little sun, minus, there may be future cutting, plus, 
soft soil, easy to dig. B. Timber, clear cut, regrowth. Plus, many old trails suitable for hiking, but usually not for vehicles due to washouts and overgrowth. Plus, many edibles and much game, but that makes it attractive to hunters. Plus, much sun, open. Question, slash, i.e. sticks and small branches left over from logging operations. Minus, poor air cover. Plus, soft soil, easy to dig. C. Timber, selective cut, mostly plateaus and basins at higher altitudes. Plus, many trails adequate for vehicles, many squat spots. Minus, easy walking. Plus, game in summer. Minus, poor air cover. Question, soil varies. D. Scrub timber, brushland. Plus, no commercial value unless it has minerals or it's near a city. Plus, fair foraging and game. Plus, open to sun. Minus, poor air cover. Plus, difficult hiking. Minus, no vehicle trails or squat spots unless it's an old mining area. Minus, difficult to dig. Rocky. 2. Site Checklist 1. Air cover, trees. 2. Ground cover, heavy brush. 3. Access distance from paved road, distance from any roadhead, raging rivers to cross in winter or spring, snowy ridges to cross in winter. 4. Seclusion, distance, brush, location relative to traffic flow, artifacts and evidence, i.e. beer cans, and other trash indicating people have been there. 5. Altitude. 6. Exposure. South-facing for solar energy. 7. Water source. 8. Water noise. 9. Slope. 10. Soil if digging is required. 11. Uniqueness in the area. Are others apt to spot it? 3. Shelter considerations. 1. Can it be built on 10% to 30% slope? Very desirable. 2. Concealment. Surface semi-underground, completely buried and concealed? 3. Economy. A. Cost of materials. Consider time to earning money, including all overhead. B. Time procuring non-native material. C. Time packing in non-native material, weight and distance. D. Time preparing trails. E. Time cutting, debarking, preparing native materials. F. Time digging. G. Fabrication. H. Visibility while construction is in progress. Native materials should be gathered away from site and concealed until use. 4. Insulation. How warm, how much of the shelter must be on the coldest winter days. 5. Condensation in summer on thick walls or ground surfaces. 6. Rain shelter. 7. Dew shelter, summer. 8. Shade, summer. 9. Insects, summer. 10. Bears. 11. Mice. 12. Wind. 13. Snow, weight. 14. Flooding, if underground, could shelter ever fill with water. 15. Strength. If underground, is structure strong enough not to cave in? 16. Rotting. Could timbers placed underground rot, weaken, and collapse? I added number 14 to 16. J.S. 4. Shelter Techniques. Semi-conclusions as of May 1972, subject to change. 1. Heating with wood is not desirable for a Vanuan for these reasons. Visible smoke. Smell. Heat radiated. Time spent cutting and transporting firewood. Removal of trees. Visual evidence. Noise of firewood cutting and splitting. Consider instead A. Body heat. Heavy insulation of part of shelter. B. Solar heating in sunny locations. C. Ground source heating. 
It stays warm up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, several feet underground even in winter. D. Propane, convertible to methane. 2. Wood construction. When making a den, digging and covering even in rocky soil takes less time than cutting, preparing, and hauling timbers. On all forms of construction so far attempted, timber preparation was the most time-consuming part. Appearance of area must not be appreciably altered. Big differences from conventional log and cabin. The fewer and smaller the timbers needed, the better. 3. Drainage. In Siskiyou, west of the Cascades, assume that any depression will become a pond, any terrace a wadi, during heavy rains. Look for evidence of streamlets. For winter shelter, either put in a floor above ground or dig a ditch around your shelter. 4. Nailing is difficult with timbers. Thick nails will split wood. Thin nails will bend. Lashing is preferable, especially with cheap synthetic cord or rope, which also won't rot. If nails must be used, drill holes first. Power drill will save time, but it's noisy and needs electricity. 5. Timber preparation. Actual cutting takes relatively little time. Most time is spent scouting suitable trees, overtopped by neighbors, away from sight. Hauling, trimming, debarking, shaping for lashing, or drilling. Power saw not desirable. 6. Conventional tents not worth the money. Polyfilm is much cheaper, waterproof, translucent, simple to erect. Not very durable, but neither are most tents. 7. For scouting, I do one-day trips away from base camp. Move base camp to go further. Two or three day duration trips with lightweight camping gear is not worthwhile. 8. Be skeptical of living off the land, claims, unless body weight was maintained, proved by careful before and after weighing. Most people who claim to have lived off the land actually lived off, consumed, their body fat, which you can do for a few weeks, but not indefinitely. Roberta has fasted for a month, for therapeutic reasons, and remained vigorous. Indians had generations of experience and use of rich bottomland, which is now settled, built on, or used for agriculture. A one-week survival course can be dangerous if it instills false confidence. Program Notes for Vanu Week, Day 4, by Rayo. See LF 29, page 4, for explanation. 1. Trail Making ground surface in this order of preference. 1. Creek, if rocky and for summer use only and not for extremely heavy loads. 2. Large rocks, no tracks. 3. Leaf and needle debris, easy to repair. 4. Gravel or sand. 5. Grass or soft vegetation. Do not saw what you can break. Do not break what you can bend. Do not bend what you can avoid. I spend about four hours scouting out route for each hour moving and bending. Angle up or down slopes, like animal tracks, except at fake-offs. Never be near end of trail. Arrange continuity. As turnoffs, make main trail, fake-off, distinct. Make turnoff through heavy brush and or at rocky place and or uphill and or re-entrant with respect to travel of strangers. Most non venuans go for outings from habitation to wilderness, are more energetic and curious, and likely to explore on way out than way back. Do not locate near end of vehicle road, always along it. Do not locate near creek accessible to road lake, specifically attractive in most areas. View place, campground, or anything marked on maps. Wilderness areas often have more people in them than nearby areas not specially designated. Arrange ambushes along trail where you have view of back trail while resting. 2. Precautions on hiking trails. 1. Wear drab clothing, but not conventional, camouflage. Dark green is the best color all around, safer than gray or brown because game animals are not green. 2. Go alone or don't talk. 3. Stop every 50 to 100 yards and listen, also good while hunting. 4. When aircraft heard, move into shade and sit down if there is time. If not, sit down and freeze. 
Sitting person is less obviously human than standing person. 5. Walk quietly. 6. Wear soft footgear unless on rocks. 7. Never run to get out of sight. 8. Do these things consistently to develop correct habits even when and where not necessary. 9. Go on nude hikes, weather and insects permitting, to develop proper attitudes, but not near base camp. Weekends are best time to move around. Better to be seen by recreationers, who will assume you are other recreationers, than by forest workers on weekdays, who will wonder more about someone they see. 3. Access roads. Pick one which either goes somewhere, recreation spot, or which turns off main road where there is no settlement. Avoid road which dead ends soon after passing last settlement. People living there will be curious about anyone driving in. Never stop along road and remain in vehicle while consulting map, etc. Forest bludgies are more likely to question someone in a stopped vehicle than to stop a moving vehicle. Don't hike on roads except at night. 4. Camouflage and Deception Polyethylene reflects light, so for permanent camp, surfaces should be vertical, angled toward north, or horizontal. Even parcel shade is de very desirable because shade breaks up shapes. Keep dwellings low, partially underground if soil is soft and drainage can be arranged, or learn to live in a low structure. Eight foot high structure can be seen much further than five foot high. Full stand up height is needed only for a few jobs. Four and a half foot high sufficient for sitting. Top cloth is non-reflecting, takes snow load, so it must be strong. Surface debris sprinkled on top. Polyethylene provides waterproofing. Clear poly in south wall provides light, or use vinyl, more expensive, if you want a clear picture window. Space between top cloth and poly provides summer shade. This dimension is chosen so that winter and morning sunlight enters for solar heating, but summer noon sun doesn't. Dark cloth of north wall is for escape of H2O and CO2 from breathing. Should not be waterproof. Should be heavy enough to stop light. Vent any stove to outside, except propane cook stove. It's much easier to hide several small camps than one big one. Put camps several hundred yards apart so that discovery of one doesn't automatically lead to discovery of others. Commute between camps. Also, small camp will arouse much less curiosity if discovered than large obviously long-used camp, and or keep minimal things at camp, stash most things 100 yards or so away in drums in bushes. Drums can be hidden better and easier than tent. Keep out of and away from tent anything confidential, illicit, work-related, not plausible for someone on vacation. Warning while occupied, heavy brush, noise, bird alarms. Warning that camp was found while you were away. Light branches or fine threads that you string up will be dislodged, broken. Footprints in sandy spots. Brush out your own before leaving. 5. If discovered. Have most important travel things in pouch so it can be put on quickly. Money, ID, knife, matches, etc. If discovery seems imminent, try to get away from camp with pouch, shoes, clothes, firearm. Hide within range of sound. Whoever happens to be dressed and up should get away, not wait for others. One person at camp, other hidden within sound and with firearm, is a good defensive situation. Unless discovery of camp appears imminent, stay put and quiet if you hear human noise in distance. Wandering around increases chance of discovery. Have calls for salutation, acknowledgement, all is well, locating. Calls should sound like bird calls. Have other calls for warning, you are in jeopardy, and help. Do not use SOS code for help unless you want to call strangers as well. Keep calls confidential. Use others when visiting friends. Use these calls as little and as softly as possible. Call whenever approaching camp or meeting place. Types of calls, signals, messages. 1. Hoots carries much further than voice enunciations. 2. Whistles, with a little disguise less conspicuous than voice. 3. 
semaphore with Morse code. Right is dot, left is dash, front is end of letter. 4. Light, at night. 5. Taps on pipe, double knock for dash. 6. Radio, dot dash is simpler, longer range than voice transmission. 7. Hand pressure while holding hands, undetectable by strangers in same room. 8. Position of letters in a letter above line means dot, below line means dash, on line means end of character or slant to left or right. 6. Storage Metal drums with banded lids are the best means I have found. Keep painted for long life. Needs good gasket. Bears will destroy almost anything else if left unattended for a long time. For food, keep in shade, short term, or in a trench, long term. For cooling short term, e.g. large animal, put in stream. Trickle water over rag over top with hose, siphoning from upstream. For long-term food storage, also use a plastic drum liner. Put in CO2 before sealing. If you use dry ice as a source of CO2, leave seals loose until it evaporates, then tighten. Use at least half ounce dry ice per gallon. Also add desiccant. For stores that are not deteriorated by heat, stash drums in bushes in small groups. Vanu Week Results by Rayo Two groups of two people each came during 1972, about what we had hoped for, many more, and we would not have had time for other things we wished to do. Both groups lived during their stays in tents, rigged out of polyethylene film, within fairly secluded, though not especially remote, wooded mountainous areas. With one group, we erected the shelter on the first day. The other group used a shelter already in place, but later put up a small stash tent. We supplied dry staple foods and Roberta demonstrated many recipes which can be prepared with simple, economical, storable ingredients. We also foraged wild foods, with which we are familiar. One group and I cached, buried, a five-gallon can of simulated valuables. There were many long wraps. On days when they were alone and explored the surrounding land, swam and read. Some who came were more knowledgeable in some areas than we which we expected and happily admitted. In general, our clients were well satisfied, although we felt that some portions of our program were marginal. One criticism was that Rayo relied too heavily on words with some subjects. Psychodrama was suggested as an alternative. Another was that we did not check out clients' knowledge of conventional survival skills, such as orienteering. Our present plans for 1973 are to offer custom services on demand give demonstrations, set up shelters or supply caches, consult in a secluded setting. Our rates are very low for services which do not require travel into that society. We are still rather inexperienced, though we know of no Vanuan who is experienced. Now that we are solving shelter problems, we can devote more effort to communication. We have tentative plans to live in a visitation area, suitable both for vehicle squatting and backpack camping during one month of summer, most likely early summer, where we can meet people within a day or so without advance notice. Reprinted from Pack Script No. 1, 25th March, 73. Against Social Reformism by Tom of Preform. Reprinted from Preform No. 9, May 1970, page 18. For those not acquainted with it, Collective movementism, also called utopianism and bullshit libertarianism, comes in many styles. There are the educationalists, who think freedom will be achieved by just talking about it, the politicians, busily campaigning for Tweedledee as the lesser evil to that terrible Tweedledum, and the revolutionists, who will want to play cops and robbers with the establishment, or more usually, talk about doing it. Some dream of a utopia of limited government capitalism, some anarcho-capitalism, and some anarcho-communism. But no matter how great their surface differences, or how bitterly they feud among themselves, they share the same fundamental fallacies. The basic premise of the collective movementists is, in essence, no one can be free unless or until everyone is free. From this authoritarian assumption, 
comes what there is of their strategy, to change society as a whole, to achieve freedom through altruistic crusades and provide it for all as a free gift. Such strategy goes contrary not only to historical experience but, in the case of the individualists, to their economic theory and social ideals as well. The anarcho-communists are at least consistent in their mistake. The collective movementists propose to produce and maintain freedom by means proven ineffective for the large-scale production of anything of value, failing to recognize that incentives or benefits must be individualizable. They embrace a dichotomy between means and ends, failing to recognize that, in social movements, the means employed will determine the ends, if any, achieved. The collective movementists are invariably utopianists, dreaming not of individual freedom for those willing to expend the effort to achieve and maintain it, but of a free society wherein millions of people behave as the dreamer thinks they should. Such a view is implicitly authoritarian, perhaps another reason why the best-intentioned political crusades have brought forth only more tyranny and destruction. Consider the results of the Russian Revolution and of the many social reform movements in the U.S. of 50 years ago. Collective movementism, in all its bizarre variations, is too flagrantly irrational to be explained just as an error in philosophy. The cause must be sought in psychology. For this I highly recommend Eric Hoffer's The True Believer. Not surprisingly, most collective movementists fail to achieve even their own personal ends. Most mass movement advocates end up as a feuding little sex. Most educationalists talk only to themselves in their little magazines, books, and conferences, their utterances so dogmatic and unrelated to reality as to repel most people. As an alternative to collective movementism slash utopianism, I advocate what I call libertarian realism, the application phase of which is self-liberation. I believe that freedom can be achieved by individuals and small groups regardless of how others choose to live. I intend to demonstrate this not through verbal manipulations, but by becoming more and more free. But words may suffice to clear up some misconceptions regarding libertarian realism. In rejecting collective movementism, the libertarian realist does not shun association with others. Rather, he recognizes that friendship and love can be the coin of trade among close, compatible personal acquaintances. In rejecting utopianism, the libertarian realist does not discard his ideals. Rather, he rejects trying to impose his ideals on others. He actualizes them in his own life. In rejecting educationism, the libertarian realist does not oppose education. Rather, he rejects the notion that most of the population can be propagandized into values and worldviews which clash with their living patterns. He recognizes that education in freedom and self-liberation must proceed hand in hand. In rejecting crusades, the libertarian realist does not neglect selling. Rather, he refuses to try to sell an empty bag, which is not selling but preaching. He recognizes that he can sell freedom to rational people as he is able to deliver it. How many automobiles would be sold by someone who claimed his design would run 30 miles on a pound of sagebrush and a quart of water, but who could not make his first delivery until 50 years after he received 20 million prepaid orders, with the automobile then to be given to everyone whether they had paid for it or not? In rejecting revolution, the libertarian realist does not necessarily shun active resistance. Rather, he rejects attempts to destroy the state per se. He uses force only to repel or deter attack upon a freedomite client. A private protection service does not attempt to eradicate stealing as a mode of behavior. Rather, it prevents or discourages burglars from molesting its customers. In rejecting social change movements, the libertarian realist does not deny the possibility of social progress. Rather, he recognizes that social change comes only as the summation of individual changes. In rejecting utopian speculation, the libertarian realist does not neglect theory. Rather, he recognizes that theory must relate to practice, otherwise it becomes mysticism. Letter from Rayo June or July, 1972. 
I'm more optimistic about crypto culture, hidden gardening, than I may have sounded. With intense cultivation, including irrigation, mulching, poly cover, and winter, a small patch will produce much food, but we haven't done it yet. Shelter remains our big concern, as it has been for two years. I prefer to be a systems engineer and use other people's components, but there is nothing on the market close to adequate in respect to Vanu with comfort and convenience, so I have to develop and build components. But our current approach, Plinu, will become completed by autumn, and if it proves out, we will be shifting major effort to food and communication. Now that I'm not involved with Vanu life, except for an article now and then, and occasional mail pickup and relay, I will try to do better on personal correspondence. Thoughts on this topic? While well, newsletter forums, VLLC, have their uses, correspondence is better for some things. Disagreements are more apt to be resolved when people disagreeing are not verbalizing for an audience. Privacy is greater because info is relayed secretively, friend to friend, not broadcast. Correspondence as a whole can be thought of as a vast, decentralized, discriminating communication net. One thing. I now put destroy after reading writings on different sheets of paper than okay to keep and maybe pass on writings. The fastest way to reach me, usually, is still Vanu life. Sometimes G or I pick up, sometimes Lan, or whoever picks up for him, does, in which case it gets left in a drop for us. I regret that you didn't get to all the subjects you wished to cover. I missed some too. I can guess a couple of questions you probably had about Lan, so I'll answer. Trustworthy? Well, he doesn't have an objectivist libertarian background. I'm convinced he is Vanuan or Vanuist. Character references he supplied, upon my request before I parted with VL, were impressive, though not of the club. I've never met him face to face, but I don't consider that important because I'm not good at evaluating people that way. He may be more than one person for all I know. Visitable? So far as I know, not. His private conduct is like his published policy. I've suggested to him that we explore trade possibilities, especially pooling purchases and trips, but so far, no response. This rather irks me since, in VL, he was all for local trade with outsiders. Apparently he takes the position that another Vanuan, who knows he is Vanuan, is less than to be trusted than a redneck who doesn't know what he is but we have exchanged letters, books, publications through Drop. Also, I sold some stationery, bulk purchased, along with VL, so maybe more trade will develop. Despite my irritation, my overall impression is that he is thoughtful and careful, cool. That maybe he has been at it a few more years than I have, has thought of a few more angles, has gotten his lifestyle further refined. He doesn't seem well informed in economics. Unfortunately, the club literature he has seen, exchanged pubs, apparently have turned him off to libertarianism. He categorized it as political, collective movementist, in his comment to me. We haven't gone into it further. I think his main interest in VL is, he thought he could increase circulation and make quite a lot of money. But after seeing his first issue, I'm not so sure. He didn't make the kind of changes I had expected. I have contractual strings on VL. If he loses interest and lets it drop, it comes bouncing back to me. After careful thought, I don't think Vanuist versus servile as such is innate. Contributing factors are undoubtedly partly innate. Intelligence, independence, stubbornness. Among my peers in, say, slave school, third grade, I don't think I would have been picked by an observer as most likely to become Vanuan. In my case, I think it was interactions of various innate and environmental factors, but I agree with Wolverine that, whatever the causes, the characteristics are probably irreversible at adult level. The crucial question for anyone remains, how much will he pay for Vanu? Freedom not only isn't free, it's quite expensive. I think the price may drop a little during the next few decades, but only a little. What makes someone a Vanuan is not any particular lifestyle, but willingness to change lifestyles whenever desirable to achieve and preserve Vanu. What makes a Vanuan is a high relative value on Vanu. 
I believe there is emerging a new club of Vanu and applied lib doers, a club which cuts across lifestyles as well as geographical boundaries, a club of people who value freedom highly, indicated by their working effectively to achieve it. The collective movementists are not part of the club, though a few may graduate to it. The club may use Rothbard's economic theory without considering Rothbard a fellow, just as it may use electronic enciphers without considering the inventors of transistors to be fellows. Might a Vanuan be more vulnerable while visible? Not according to our experience. To the contrary, we seem to be hassled less, even proportionately, perhaps because we are more careful, also we don't have the same psycho need to talk back, etc. But perhaps what you suggest would happen with someone out of sight in much more or longer than us. No, I don't think the two definitions are identical, but someone who spends most of his life within sight of must spend most of his life behaving similar to a sheep person, which is an enormous psychological load. I'm not convinced this is healthy. It wasn't for me when I tried it. I think eventually there will emerge new, sophisticated blends which are both more Vanu and yet provide more access. We presently are more Vanu, yet have better trade access than, say, Fletchers of Driftwood Valley. But I think wilderness squatting for a year or two may be a necessary stage for most Vanuans to get their heads together. Thoughts on Rayo from Living Free Subscribers December 84 and March 85 Letter from James H. December 1984 The long piece on Rayo was fascinating, maybe less so to a recent subscriber, but to those of us who have been with you for some time and know the background, it is very good. Rayo comes across as less of a practical fellow than I had expected. All these guys seem to rely on modern technologies even as they seek escape. His polyethylene tent, for example, could have been abandoned in favor of a woodcutter's pole and leaf hut, which is made more quickly with local materials, and it is its own camouflage. Comment. The trouble with a pole and leaf hut is that the roof leaks, which would be intolerable in Oregon in winter, where rains are torrential. Making a leak-proof roof is the hardest problem when you're building with native materials, and poly offers a quick and cheap solution. I think it's okay to use modern technology as long as you don't depend on it. Rayo could easily shift to native materials if or when he could no longer get plastic, or it became too expensive. Why do it the hard way before then? I fault Rayo on other grounds, the opposite grounds actually. I think his lifestyle was too primitive rather than not primitive enough. His whole program seems to maximize discomfort and inconvenience, for what reason? To gain freedom, he would say. But what kind of freedom is it if you have to impose such very restrictive rules on yourself? It's like wounding yourself to prevent other people from wounding you. I think I'm a lot freer on my rural acreage than Rayo was in his hideout. Sure, I pay $100 a year in taxes, but after that I can do as I please. That cost me less than all his sneaking around cost Rayo. I think he made an unwise trade-off. Letter from Roger Kinmore in response to Jim Stum's comment, September 1985. Dear Jim, I am writing in response to your comment in Living Free, number 31. I think I'm a lot freer on my rural acreage than Rayo was in his hideout. Sure, I pay $100 a year in taxes, but after that I can do as I please. That cost me less than all his sneaking around costs Rayo. You could also say that you spent two years in the U.S. Army, but after that you can do as much as you please. Modern statism, with its claim of preserving a free society, will allow you to do as you please after you have complied with its regulations and paid its taxes. But as you yourself make clear in Is Self-Liberation Impossible? Random Writings Number 2, sneaking around is the best means of achieving more freedom in a society dominated by a state. You fault Rayo for bearing too high a cost for too little benefit, but you forget that his values are not necessarily your values. Perhaps his valuation of freedom was higher and his disvaluation of sneaking around was lower than yours. What sort of freedom do you get on your rural acreage for your $100 per year taxes? 
How free would you be at $1,000 per year? How free would you be if the state took over your land to build a road or used your deed as a means to find you to send you into the army? If by freedom you really mean solitude, why not say it so? It is a legitimate enough desire. I have often thought that the notion of freedom is closely connected to pride. To that extent, the power of another, including the state, can be opposed by either self-liberation or power. Rayo sought to live without needing a driver's license or vehicle registration. You have given up this freedom and consider it a benefit worth the costs to be able to drive on government roads with little fear of harassment, even though you know the government has you by the balls. It is hard to rationalize the belief of not having a vehicle, owning land or collecting a taxable income aside from the pride of knowing one is not at the mercy and bidding of the state. Unless, of course, one is running from the law because of a specific crime, or one has nightmares of a totalitarian future, or one sees oneself as pioneering a new lifestyle. How do you rationalize your own long-term efforts and discomforts to minimize your taxable income so as to give as little money as possible to the government? As if, in the society of millions, your income tax could make any palpable difference to the state. Sincerely, Roger Kinmore. Return Comments for Roger Kinmore from Jim Stum, 1985 Here are some of the things I'm free to do on my rural acreage that a wilderness Vanuan is not free to do. Of greatest importance, I can be seen on my land by neighbors, or even by government officials, without the fear of bad consequences, whereas a Vanuan must avoid being seen by anyone, as Rayo makes quite clear. Then, I can openly plant gardens, trees, bushes, while the Vanuan can only attempt cryptoculture, trying to hide all signs of cultivation. I can cut down any trees I want, while the Vanuan must select trees to cut at wide intervals far from his building site. I can cut trails and clearings and make any changes in the landscape that I please, while the Vanuan must spend his time wiping out signs of trails, etc. Of course I wouldn't be any freer if I paid $1,000 a year in property taxes rather than $100 a year. It's not a question of buying freedom in proportion to tax dollars spent, but rather a yes-no situation to be in legal possession of the property or not. You ask how free I would be if the state took over my land for a road. The probability of that happening to any given landowner is low, about like being struck by lightning. But the same question could be put to a troglodyte Vanuan. How free would Rayo be if he spent a couple years building an underground home on public land and then the state cut a road through nearby. Actually, a landowner has the advantage, because if the new road bypassed his property by only a few yards, he could still remain. But if a new road was cut through even a mile away from Rayo's remote den, he would probably feel compelled to abandon it. You ask what if the state used my deed to find me to send me into the army. I haven't heard of draft boards searching property deeds to find draft evaders. Anyway, I'm not at risk from the draft. If I were, I would probably use an alias and lease some acreage from a farmer rather than buy it. Still, there are ways to buy land and still keep your name off the records. You could create a false ID in your new name. Then again, I don't recall being asked to prove my identity when I bought my land. I suppose I could have used any name I wanted, as long as I could receive mail in that name. Other ways are to set up a corporation, perhaps offshore, and buy land in the name of the corp. Or, you might make a deal with an organization that you have no connection with, e.g. for-profit corps, or a non-profit, or a church, by which they buy land you select with money you loan to them, then they lease it back to you for as long as you live. At your death, it reverts to them. That's their payoff. A non-profit or church may be exempt from paying property taxes, but playing that game may be pushing your luck. As for really meaning solitude, when I say freedom, that charge applies to Rayo more than to me. I have had visitors at my land, and I didn't blindfold them or swear them to secrecy. It's no concern to me if they tell others about my property. Rayo, on the other hand, is notoriously secretive about his home site. So which of us is really pursuing solitude? Lowering my income taxes isn't the only reason for my low-income lifestyle. I also want to be employed only about 20 hours a week so I have time for other things. 
and I found I didn't like the pressures to conform imposed on me by employers when I was in management as manager of a checking account department in a bank. Now, as a janitor, I find that mostly nobody pays attention to me. The main thing is, I pursue my own values, which are somewhat different from yours or Rayo's. I mention quite often that we all have different subjective values. Rayo, however, seems to have never realized that. He often says or implies that people who don't adopt his wilderness Vanuan lifestyle must be not truly committed to freedom, not realizing that other people may want to be free to different things which cannot easily be done in the woods or not easily without owning one's land. Sure, you can scrupulously obey all laws and pay all taxes and government would then probably not harass you. But living free is edited for people whom that solution to the freedom problem is intolerable. My argument for landowning is not just advocacy of that solution. Rather, I see landowning as a special case where costs can be so low and benefits so high that avoiding it makes no sense. E.g., I get two tax bills a year in the mail totaling about $100. I pay them by mail. That's all the contact I have ever had with government as a landowner since I bought my land. The county knows nothing about me except name and address, and they have no reason to inquire. I also paid one time $2,500 for six acres, which I would recover more or less if I sell the land. That's all my cost for which I get all the benefits alluded to above. You can make a stronger case against legally driving a motor vehicle on government roads because that costs much more than owning land costs me. My mandatory car insurance alone costs more than my property taxes, and a driver is at risk of being stopped and harassed by cops every moment that he is driving, whereas the landowner is at much less risk of being harassed while he is at home on his land. On the contrary, it is the Vanuan hiding out in the national forest who is constantly at risk of being harassed by forest bludgies. So who is really freer? Comments on Camping by Bert in Oregon, December 85. Concerning the controversy over whether it's better to buy acreage or to use the wilderness, Living Free, number 32, page 6, and earlier issues. Holly and I have backpack camped for eight years now full-time except for occasional short house sittings and visits with city friends. We have camped both on farms and homesteads and on open forest lands in dozens of places in western Oregon, also in Washington and Colorado and elsewhere. Both types of situations have worked out well for us. Only twice have we had disagreements with private landowners that prompted us to move sooner than intended, and that happened many years ago when we were inexperienced with such arrangements. We have never had any trouble camping on open lands, including land owned or administered by forest services, timber companies, and BLM. Most of our camping on private land is while working for the owners, though we also do so occasionally to be close to town or to borrow electric power tools. At other times, we prefer public lands because there's more room to roam and less noise, and because we aren't under obligation to anyone. We once considered buying a few acres, but didn't, because the advantages didn't seem worth the costs and responsibilities. Jim wrote that on land he'd bought, he could plant a garden or trees more freely than in the wilderness. We haven't planted much, but talking with people who have, my impression is that out in the bush, and even in many rural areas, the biggest loss isn't to thieves, but to deer, rabbits, mice, cutworms, etc. No trespassing signs won't matter to them. Jim also wrote that on land he'd bought he could be seen, with less fear of bad consequences than in the wilderness. When we hike on backwood trails, we aren't seen by many people. I recall only three in eight years. Two were hunting deer, one was gathering mushrooms. If we do see someone, we say hi maybe exchange a few pleasantries and trek on. So what are the bad consequences? No one has tried to kill or rob us. I suppose it's possible someone might, but how would our owning the land stop them? In fact, hiking and camping on just our own few acres might jeopardize us more, because people would get to know we were there. I've seen two Vanu books and most back issues of Living Free, but I don't understand why Vanuans must never be seen. I can appreciate them not wanting strangers wandering into their camps, 
neither do we, nor do most people. But when away from camp, why does being seen have worse consequences for a Vanuan than for anyone else? Jim wrote that road construction a mile away would compel Rayo to abandon his den. Why? Most of our camps have been less than a mile from the nearest road. Oregon west of the Cascades is so laced with logging roads we'd be hard-pressed to get a mile away, and we don't make great efforts to hide our camps, though we don't call attention to them either. Yet no one has ever visited us uninvited. I assume that Rayo's den, underground is it not, would be much harder to spot than is one of our camps. We do occasionally hear logging, motorbikes, shots, dogs, etc. Even if there were no roads, we'd still hear airplanes. We like solitude, but not so much we want to move to Antarctica. I wonder if the disagreement doesn't reflect east-west differences. In most of the west, there's plenty of open land suitable for camping, but not many small plots you can buy, except near towns and along highways, and that land is expensive. In the east, my impression is, it's the other way around. Whether on land you've bought, land you've rented, or open land, camping offers many advantages, along with disadvantages, of course, compared to building a house or cabin or bringing in a mobile home. Attractions for us include easy exchanges of scene, more choice of locations, more natural surroundings, and more privacy. But the bottom line is very low cost. Jim mentioned needing to work only 20 hours a week. We need to work only 5 hours a week, about. That's averaged over a year. Actually, we work only one or two months a year usually, but put in 40 to 50 hours a week then. Working on farms, the pay is low, but we clear more than we did at factory and office jobs where there was rent or commuting, taxes, convenience foods because less time to cook, special clothing needed, etc. Many people try camping, but have an unpleasant time because of insufficient or inappropriate equipment or inexperience and conclude that camping necessarily means hardships, discomforts, and inconveniences. Not so. We've been as comfortable camping as we ever were living in apartments. There have been unpleasant moments, such as unexpected rain while moving, but every dwelling way has its problems. In a house or apartment, the electricity may go off, the furnace breaks down, the pipes freeze, the frame eaten by termites, etc. A commercial. Most of the light living library is now on microfish. 38 plans and booklets, 95 pages, concerning portable dwelling and low-cost self-reliant living, all for only $1 postpaid, from Message Post, P.O.B. 190-LF, Philomath, Oregon, 97370. Also see Unclassified Ad. Comments for Bert from Jim Stum. Regarding gardens being eaten by varmints, that seems to be the major problem in boondocks, as I have found out for myself. It's not that way in urban areas where I never have that problem. The solution is to put a fence around the garden. But if you do that on public land, and the bludge, bureaucrats, forest police, whatever they are called, find it, they will at least break down your fence and may harass you for putting it up. Regarding being seen, Vanuans are not directly concerned with being seen by civilians and not much worried that they might be robbed or killed by private criminals. Their main concern is that they don't want to be seen by Bludge or by civilians who will squeal and reveal their presence to Bludge. Why? Vanuans want to live free. That's primary. Their strategy for gaining max political freedom is the government won't, can't, oppress you if they don't even know you exist. So the idea is to live out of sight and mind of those who might coerce you, meaning mainly government Bludge. Vanuans want to disappear from the mainstream society, which they consider unbearably oppressive. Rayo often refers to it as slave society, or that society, spoken contemptuously. But they pay a high price for this invisibility, and I suggest in LF that the benefits may not be worth such a high price, at least not until USA becomes a much worse police state. I'm only speculating when I say Rayo would abandon his underground den if a road was built as near as a mile away. I mean a road with some traffic on it. Rayo wouldn't be concerned about abandoned logging roads. He uses such roads himself to get his camper back into the woods. But a new, well-traveled through road would give access to outsiders, to Bludge, and to hordes of good citizens who act as willing ears for Bludge. 
His invisibility could not long be maintained if people who were wandering in the woods within a mile of their parked vehicles stumbled across his den and then went off blabbing in every bar and gas station in the area, as they would, about the extensive construction that some weird hermit had built way out there in the woods. Soon authorities would hear of it and would pay him a visit to ask him how dare he build without permission on their public land. Then at least they would break up his construction, they bulldoze cabins built without permits on private land, and they might even arrest him for something. The need for invisibility arises if you want to build something permanent, a cabin, fences, hydropower system, etc. It's less essential for a transient camper, unless there's a warrant out for you. The east-west difference you note is true. Also, in the northeast, even wilderness that is inaccessible in summer may be wide open to every yahoo on a snowmobile in winter. Letters from Rayo slash Tom of Preform 19th September 1972 Half-life of engineering capability in digital electronics and computers is only a couple of years. Result, everyone is out of date except on the particular thing he is working on. Someone 10 or even 20 years out of date can learn current techniques almost as fast as someone two years out of date. He just dives in at a good engineering library and learns where the technology is now in subject areas relevant to his project. He doesn't have to learn the intervening history. I don't presently have time or facilities to do electronic development, so it is more efficient for me to wait until I do and then catch up. I am receiving one electronics journal, which I glance at and then store away. Not knowing more about the scrambling technique, I can't comment on decodability. It is no great feat to come up with a technique which is essentially unbreakable, but a difficult to break rather than unbreakable technique might be chosen for lower cost and simplicity of use possibility of death. How many thousands have taken outward bound? How many have been killed? And that in a course designed to generate stress, push people to the limit. So what is the chance of someone dying during Vanu week? Not zero, but so small I don't consider it worth considering in advance. There are many more probable dangers and discomforts to be considered, it is not efficient to prepare for or even to consider the very low probability possibilities. Only one out of a hundred persons bitten by rattlesnakes die, and this includes little children and people with bad hearts, etc., but good care will reduce length and severity of illness. Space blankets are presently very expensive. However, Alcoa sells finely perforated aluminum foil to restaurants for keeping baked potatoes warm, etc., which might work as well in a stationary structure, not as strong. But I try to minimize use of metal in new development because of possibility of detectability in future, though I don't think this is a present problem. Enclosed is a food consumption tabulation for Vanu week. I don't know what caused your digestive upsets. You might try eating nothing but boiled, sprouted wheat and beans for breakfast and lunch every day for a week, while otherwise living in your ordinary way and eating your ordinary food for supper. I submitted to Vanu Life a long article on our present life. This may be in a September issue. I haven't received a copy yet. This tells something about our experience with mice and rats. There are many lizards around, but an edible portion. I suspect is even smaller than a mouse. And they eat flies, thereby reducing that problem. We will begin eating insects in quantity if and when we find an easy way to procure some kind in quantity. I agree that presentation of Vanu week could be much improved. We'll work on it if we continue to give it. I remember reading your LC article and liking it except for disagreeing with the part about the sadomasochistic club analogy. If I were the involuntary victim, I would probably wreck the joint and mangle some of the members on the way out if I could do so without too much additional risk or bother to discourage them from bothering me and my friends in the future. Certainly, I wouldn't feel that it was moral for me to do so. Interesting that L considers you and I political, whereas we consider ourselves non-political as she considers herself. Actually, we are post-political. Both of us went through a political, or at least an educationalist ideological phase, but we are past it. Apparently she hasn't gone through it. Then there are the bullshitters, or true believers, who get hung up in it. 
I continue to believe that anti-statist ideology is necessary, although certainly not sufficient for Vanu any form. Question. How can someone develop from an unaware to an anti-statist, Vanuist, anti-political worldview without going through the collective movementist utopian stage? How self-sufficiently is the author of the economics article now living? I just finished reading Last of the Mountain Man. Wasn't too impressed. Our lifestyle this autumn and the first part of winter. We sleep in the lay foam hut under a small poly tent, which is within easy commuting distance of our camper. We cook and eat, except breakfast, and do most other things in camper. During spells of good weather, I go for several days at a time to the plenu on which I am still working. The camper is now in a different squat spot than the one you saw, but in the same general area. I expect we will move to the plenu in February or March, if structure and drainage prove out. I don't recommend doing Vanu week like we did with you in February, since Poly Tent is a marginal shelter then. We lived under Poly most of last winter, but we had a foam hut. So I suggest that C check with us later in the winter regarding our situation and his interests. After we moved to Plenu, we could put him and family up quite comfortably in camper plus foam hut, but this might not be what he wants. Since you were a paying guest, and I felt it would be as improper to ask you to clean up, except for your personal things, as to expect a tenant at a motel to wash the bedding and vacuum the rug before leaving, the day after you left, I hiked up, took down the tent, brought down the food things, and stashed most other things in the drum in some bushes nearby. I have since brought down the drum. The bed frame is still there. I don't expect it will be seen by many people. It is much less visible even than the tent was nor would it arouse much curiosity if it was seen. There has been logging in the area, so there are other artifacts. And if we want to move camp sometime in a hurry, it is nice to have a bed already there. My present thoughts on future Vanu week. Most of VW presentation was verbal, and that form is adequate, if not most efficient or entertaining. The best way to remember is by actually doing, and there is a fair amount of that. So we intend to put the words on paper, have plenty of illustrations, very clear labels, sprout jar, etc. We will sell or rent Vanu Place, squat spot already scouted, equipment, grub stake and detailed instructions stashed nearby. To the client we send directions. He comes when he wants, leaves when he wants. We get deposit on equipment, and he never sees us. We anticipate as many questions as possible in instructions. Others can get answered, slowly, through message drop. We offer a variety of squat spots, varying in access and remoteness, terrain, and vegetation. Used spots sell or rent at discount. This way, our Vanu isn't degraded if we get large clientele. Eventually I hope to provide communication links for live answering of questions, but not next summer. 21st November, 1972 did you receive my letter of 19th September? P.O. box was broken into about 21st October. By good fortune, mail had been picked up on 19th October, so not much was stolen. Betterment committee? Don't know. Anyway, I am concerned that either my 19th September letter did not reach you, or your reply might have been among the items stolen. Roberta and I will obtain a mailing address in a large city with UP link to local pickup as soon as we can arrange it. This is something we have been going to do for a long time. Now we will move faster. Have you heard anything about random opening and checking of mail at U.S. border? 14 December, 1972 Perhaps it is only a coincidence, but the two letters of mine which you didn't receive were both over an ounce but with sufficient postage to go first class. There was a little bludge activity in the area that might possibly have been precipitated by something in September letter but was more likely caused by a hunter. While I was working in that society, I spent a large part of my time doing technical work, which was essentially puzzle solving. Perhaps that's why puzzles have not appealed to me since I was a child. Now projects like Volan, artificial language, fill this need for me. Whether Volan proves sufficiently useful to justify my time expenditures as other than recreation remains to be seen but perhaps the fact that it might prove useful makes it more appealing than puzzles. 
I would not have guessed about L what you said about her in your 2 December letter. So much for ability to evaluate face to face. My impression at the time, very competent, few hang-ups, but mysticism was incongruous, indicative of some problem. I received a long report from someone who was Atlantis 1 for several months. I cannot reveal the source nor pass it on. But based on it, I would withdraw any money I had in ATCOPS. I find I'm especially interested in erotics when I'm not getting any. This hasn't been a problem since I met Roberta. If your lover would feel betrayed and end the relationship because you took another girl, with whom you were not even having erotics, to Vanu Week, what does this say about the rationality of your lover? I find your suspicions of lifestyle seduction incomprehensible. If you recall, L expressed definite interest in staying. My reply was something like, sure, go ahead and stay at your camp, and we can bring you another drum full of food and mail every couple of months. If we were desperately seeking more people, we could have made her a more attractive offer, such as employment with us for a few hours a month, clearing squat spots or something, sufficient to pay for her food and leave her a little over. Actually, Roberta and I are not as committed to wilderness Vanu, at least to the exclusion of everything else, as we might seem. We go through a period of doubts rethink each winter. If it were not for the nuclear threat, we might be trying to build a smile under St. Monica Mountains or maybe Tilden Park, Berkeley. At the moment, Roberta is more sold on wilderness Vanu than I. We now look upon ourselves as Vanu experimentalists. We can afford the luxury of this partly because we aren't in desperate need for Vanu. No immediate problems with draft, school-aged children, etc. About you. 1. I had no reason to believe you were interested in becoming a wilderness Vanuan. You have repeatedly said you weren't. I have no reason to disbelieve you. 2. If, nevertheless, you did, I expect you would do it in your present location. The main emphasis of Roberta and I right now is developing a way of living for us that combines maximum Vanu with comfort. Until we have problems of living the year around better solved than we do at the moment, it is foolish to attract others to join us. If somebody wants to experiment on their own, fine. Good luck. Orion's visit the previous summer convinced us that we were not yet prepared for associating, at least on a year-round basis, with anyone who wasn't at least experienced and equipped as we were. The thing we can do which is most likely to attract others and attract them on a sound basis is to increase the vanu, comfort, convenience, and capability of our own lifestyle. What people might come then, I have no idea. Most likely they will be people we don't even know of at present. We probably value you as much as a non-coercivist, anti-statist if you are, with a different but somewhat interrelated lifestyle, living in a region in which we have some interests, as we would as a neighboring wilderness Vanuan. Enough? My evidence isn't conclusive, but judging from the few experience I have had or heard about others having when a reliable contact, agent, friend, or helper is needed under emergency conditions involving bludge, even a bullshit libertarian, educationalist, collective movementist, will probably be more reliable and competent than a normally reliable and competent non-libertarian. The bullshit libertarian is at least anti-coercion in theory, and this had some effect on his subconscious emotions and attitudes. Also, the bullshit libertarian has probably had a few daydreams or nightmares about what he would do if, which is more than the non-lib has had and is better than nothing. One case I heard about. Bludge were seeking X. They went to X's mother and identified themselves. She supplied the only address she had for X, which was the address of a lifelong non-lib friend of X's, who was forwarding X's mail. Bludge went to friend of X. He supplied them with the last residential address of X he knew, but X had recently moved. Bludge went to residential address. They got no information from several libertarians, probably mostly educationalists, though I'm not sure, who were there but received full cooperation from a very capable non-libertarian. An explicit non-coercivist ideology certainly isn't sufficient, but I continue to believe that it is necessary. I intend to limit friends and close acquaintances to those who evidence it. 
Supposedly, non-ideological people usually have an ideology at the subconscious level, and it is usually the prevailing status ideology of that society. They don't verbalize much about it, in part because they perceive little conflict between that ideology and the world around them. Bullshit libertarians at least perceive a conflict, so they verbalize. The latter is just a thought at the moment. I suspect it's more involved than that. When involved in a conflict between friend and bludge, the usually competent non-lib is caught up in conflict of values, which will likely cause him to act less competently than the usually not-so-competent bullshit libertarian. I'm conceding that a good many BS libs are not very competent under normal conditions, which is one reason they're BS libs. Eric Hoffer's Hypothesis Introduction to Pack Script Number 1 by Tom of Preform, 25th March, 1973. Editor's Note. Packscript was a one-issue newsletter edited by Tom, as he explains below. Packscript number one was two pages long. I intend to reprint the parts of it that were written by Tom. I have already published Vanu Week results taken from Packscript number one in LF31, page six. I still haven't heard anything about any more issues of Packscript besides this number one. If anyone ever saw any other issues, please let me know, even if you no longer have it. I'm doing Packscript not because I especially enjoy writing, but, on the contrary, because writing is slow and difficult to me. If I relied entirely on personal letters, I could send brief, we are fine, how are you, notes. But I wouldn't have time to develop ideas pass on information, or tell about what we are doing. The cost of offset printing is low, provided a printer has the proper equipment for the job. At least one printer in Berkeley charges only two seventy-five for a hundred copies of an eight and a half by eleven sheet, both sides, not mail order. So, with photo reduction, we can save money as well as time by printing that information which we wish to share with a number of people postage savings pay for printing cost. Mottos. Every Vanuan a publisher. Those that can write well, write. Those that can't, edit. Packscript is the second Zenet mini-magazine word coined by Lan of VL. I've started during the past five years. The first preform inform grew beyond original expectations, changed name to Vanu Life, and now, under management of Lan, seems to be becoming the popular mechanics of freedom achievers. As it grows, VL becomes more valuable for how to do it info, but less useful for making and maintaining contacts. Unlike some Znets, Packscript is for Vanu achievers who would like to meet in person occasionally, as well as communicate by mail. For this reason, we are limiting distribution to the Pacific Coast. Also for this reason, Packscript is traded only for information, not sold for money. We are not opposed to money transactions, but we wish to keep Packscript small and personal. We welcome information relevant to Vanu in any form, written or spoken. Letters, newspaper clippings, loan of books or magazines, publication exchange, conversations, introduction to other Vanuans, leads to sources, etc. I'll assume I may pass on to Packscript readers unless you say otherwise. Vanu achievers include not only those who are decreasing their own vulnerability to coercion, but individuals who offer services which reduce the vulnerability of others, such as mail receiving and forwarding, phone answering, storage, squat spots, garden sites, and free market, no tax, no social security, cash pay, employment. All forms of Vanu which can be implemented along the Pacific coast are of interest to us. Troglodism Vehicle nomadism, smoomism, boat living, urban anonymity. Opportunities for mutually profitable exchange are often greatest between people with different lifestyles. I'll assume that every Packscript reader also reads Vanu Life and will not try to duplicate information that's in there. On the other hand, there is much intentional duplication of what is in VZE publications, such as Vanu Link. Vanu Life is now an annual book and is separate from Vanu Link. VZE members trade pool pages. This means I print extra copies of some pages, but not personal identifying data, 
which they can include in their newsletters, and they do the same for me. See pool page B from Vanu Link, which is part of this issue for more info on pool pages. So some of the material in PackScript is written, edited, and printed by others and does not necessarily represent our views. I'm sending this issue to personal friends and acquaintances, some people who subscribe to PI, people referred to PackScript by Vanu Life, some people who have published letters in Vanu Life by forwarding through VL. Distribution of the next issue will probably begin in early summer, likely deadline June 1st. Editor's note, when he says Vanu Life is now an annual, Tom is referring to VL 1973, the special handbook issue. An issue like that was to be produced every year, but only one such issue was ever published. He calls it a book, but it was printed in newsletter format, with very small print, on newsprint paper, which is now, after 13 years, becoming very yellow and brittle. The pool page B mentioned is the same as Vanu Link page VL11 P4, on which Lan explains his complicated idea for splitting VL into a number of Znets, the details and purpose of which I could never comprehend. Letter to ASC Magazine from Tom Editor's Note This is an obscure item. A letter appeared in July 1973, Alternative Sources of Energy magazine, unsigned, but I believe it may have been written by Tom. I base this conclusion on three clues. 1. Writer mentions living in Siskiyou region. 2. Address used is ALA, Box 91, Berkeley, California, 94701, which is the same address Tom uses in PackScript number 1. I believe that that P.O. box was used by several libertarian groups in Berkeley and that ALA stands for Association of Libertarian Activists or something like that. 3. I recall that Tom was interested in developing hydroelectric power at his hidden underground den, which was well within his abilities since he was an electrical engineer, so the following may be Tom speaking. Water Power we have a site suitable for small hydroelectric power, about a hundred foot head at 10 gallons per minute, which we would like to use to drive an automobile alternator and recharge batteries for a 12 volt electrical system. A friend recommended that we use a carbon vein pump such as airborne sales number 1191. Has any reader had experience doing this? A problem we've run into is that surplus houses, not only airborne but pally, are sold out of carbon vein pumps, which can handle water. Does anyone know of places which still handle these? We'd also like suggestions as to the best alternator to use. We need one that's fairly small with low friction, perhaps from a foreign car, since at best we will be getting only two or three amps out. We live in the Siskiyou region of Northern California and would enjoy contacted other ASE readers in the area. ALA, Box 91. Berkeley, California, 94701. What Are We Doing? by Tom of Preform. Reprinted from Packscript No. 1 with some editing and comments. 25th March, 1973. I'm sitting in our camper on a street in Berkeley putting this issue together, i.e. Packscript No. 1 though much of it was written or printed previously. I'm doing it now because 1. We have a new mailing address and I want to make it known. 2. There is a low-cost printer in Berkeley. 3. I have some spare time over a weekend. Most future issues will be typed and sometimes mimeoed in our mountain hideaways. We are on our annual shopping slash visiting trip to the big cities. From Berkeley, we go south along the coast to Los Angeles then to Baja, Tom has another tooth which needs a gold crown, then back to L.A., then north on Highway 5 to Tehachapi Mountains, then north on Highway 5 to Siskiyou Region. Temporary addresses. Until about April 5th, care of General Delivery, Laguna Beach, California. Write us there if you wish to contact us while we are in Southern California. From about April 5th to April 15th, care of General Delivery, Lebec, California. 
Write us there if you wish to contact us while we are in Tehachapi Mountains or along Highway 5. I suggest putting our permanent address on the envelope as return address in case the letter misses us. Report on annual food purchases follows with out-of-date prices. Tom mentions brown rice, pink beans, black mission figs, pitted Iraq dates, nutritional yeast, wheat, raisins, powdered milk, honey, and dextrose. They buy their year's supply of food on this annual swing through the big cities. J.S. We can deliver non-organic brown rice or pink beans to any place on our route for $13.50 and $15 per 100-pound sack, respectively. Hulled sunflower seeds do not store well, even in cool CO2 atmosphere. This year, we bought sesame seeds at $0.36 cents a pound for a high oil supplement slash condiment. At present, our overall lifestyle is a blend of van nomadism, troglodism, and smoomism, and is moving towards the latter two. Troglodism equals living physically underground. Smoomism equals moving between several homes hidden in the wilderness. J.S. Except for one smile, we are still experimenting with. We will not be building more completely underground structures in the near future. Our present shelter work is mostly with small, well-concealed structures on the surface and partly underground. The shift in our interest is due not only to the problems with underground shelters, especially drainage and condensation, but to growing confidence in and ability at concealment on the surface. While it is conceivable that Big Brother may eventually have surveillance systems capable of identifying almost any human habitation on the surface, I don't think this will be a serious threat during the next 20 to 30 years. We built the basic structure for a semi-underground home and shop last spring and summer. If it overwinters well, we will complete the interior and move in this spring. Although our shelter problems aren't completely solved, we seem to be close to year-round comfort with a high degree of Vanu, perhaps 20 years MTH. MTH equals mean time to harassment, an estimate of degree of invulnerability to coercion, JS. We now believe that outside interfacing, not shelter, will be the most difficult part of Vanu living. For this reason, we are gravitating towards a SMUM way of life. There may be an article on SMUM in Vanu Life 1973. There was. See SMUMMINS, the Super Hobos, in VL 73, page 101. JS. We are becoming interested in crypto culture. Crypto culture equals hidden gardening. JS. A few years ago, I had dreams of growing pot in hidden patches and selling it. Apparently quite a few people are doing this. Now we are more interested in growing potatoes. To reduce transport, we presently import 1,200 pounds a year, and interfacing needs. There may be food rationing within a few years. We stress physical concealment as much as we do because we are interested in the growth of an alternate economy, not just in personal retreat and retirement. And I don't believe that free market enterprise will be profitable much beyond what is already being done, illegal products, services at very high prices mostly, until quite a few people have secure shelters. Such non-Vanu alternate enterprises as food co-ops are likely to escape most taxes and regulations only so long as they remain too few and too small to offer substantial competition to fascist, regulated businesses. There was a big co-op movement during the early 30s too, the survivors, today, are as regimented and bureaucratic as General Mills, e.g. CNH Sugar. I have been accused of being some sort of an ascetic who is dedicating his life to advancing Vanu. This is true, in a sense, but the implications of self-sacrifice and masochism are utterly false. Once status games and food fetishes are weeded out, physical comfort essentially means having a soft, warm bed, a cuddly bedmate, and nutritious food within easy reach of the bed on days when it's cold and wet outside. There are also various kinds of intellectual stimulations and desires, but there are many alternate ways to satisfy these, including ways compatible with Vanu living. One need not duplicate the specific entertainments of the servile society. I am devoting most of my life to advancing Vanu because I find I can have the most pleasure and satisfaction this way. 
Not only are most tasks interesting and enjoyable in themselves, but there's an added exhilaration in overall integration, having an overpurpose, in most tasks, means as well as ends. This is missed by a playboy who flits from ski slope to nightclub to chess game, each activity unrelated to the others. Advancing Vanu, especially wilderness Vanu, is an overpurpose especially suitable for a rational hedonist because of the variety of physical and mental activities involved and profusion of satisfactions offered. Many overpurposes, in contrast, involve intense specialization of activity and do not fulfill most emotional capacities, leading to frustration or conflicts. Examples, trying to become world's tennis champion, earn a billion dollars, discover a cancer cure, become a rock superstar. March, comments by Rayo, from Pack Script Number One, March 1973. Comments on Via Via proposal. A proposal for Via Via, a vehicle nomadic community in Southern California, was published in Preform Inform Number Three, January 1969. When I wrote and published this four years ago. I was doubtful that there were enough full-time vehicle nomads in the Los Angeles area and potentially interested in such a life for Via Via to be feasible and profitable then. I estimated one chance in three that such an association would actually materialize then, but I felt that a definite proposal would stimulate interest and discussion. About a dozen advanced surveys came back, not bad considering the circulation of PI was about 50 at the time. Only one respondent indicated interest in living in Via Via most of the time, so there wasn't sufficient market. There probably is now, assuming someone is interested in organizing something like that. I'm on to other projects. I believe I was over-optimistic as to the degree of seclusion that could be achieved. With a large number of vehicles coming and going, including even trailers, there would be a well-worn trail to Via Via so it would probably have to be on fenced private land with permission, or else 100 feet or more of some special kind of ground covering, portable driveway, would have to be put down at the turnoff from the last access road each time a vehicle came and went. Planks on pegs? The cost of renting private land might be such as to make the venture unattractive. Landlords who would welcome one family as caretakers would be very dubious of a large group. One serious oversight was not including a per-trip component in the rates to discourage and or pay the added costs and risks of frequent commuting. Editor's Note ATCOPS, Atlantis Commodity Purchasing Service, was a silver bullion bank meant to be a forerunner to a Bank of Atlantis, which was a project of Operation Atlantis, an attempt to start a libertarian new country in the Caribbean. ATCOPS offered accounts denominated in decagrams of silver. To Rayo, on the basis of your recommendation, I withdrew about from my ATCOPS account, leaving only a few decas to keep the account operational. You had intimated to me that ATCOPS was in a pickle economically, and I took your recommendation in December as further proof. Now I gather from VL number 11 that the reason is based on an act committed by Travers, manager of Atlantis Motel. I further think that Stevens is probably right about the difficulty of obtaining a manager plus whatever who would have acted differently. Possibly when and if a better one comes along, Stevens would phase Travers out. Just what do you expect Stevens to do? I'm sure he deals with many less than ideal persons whom he could avoid dealing with only by dropping hope for Atlantis. The absurdity of this internecine quibble is most tragically demonstrated by the fact that I now have the sitting in a savings account at the bank of, which I am sure is fully staffed by individuals much like those who constitute the mass of society, with a lifetime of fascist socialist thinking as a background unhesitatingly and obviously willing to commit coercivist actions 
far exceeding those committed by Travers. I don't know of any Swiss bank or investment company with a less coercivist management to keep the money on hand would make me very uncomfortable, and I do not want assets so unliquid to be in the form of buried gold. Rayo's Reply I did not intimate that Atkops was in a pickle economically. I have no knowledge of the financial condition of Atkops except, judging from the little information in Atlantis News, it's rather speculative. The only source of income with which to pay interest is hoped-for profits from commodity speculation, according to AN. Nor do I know what, if any, connection Travers has with Atkops specifically. I have heard from a reliable source that Travers was effectively the manager of Atlantis's boat project, though I did not see this mentioned in AN. According to this same source, Stevens devoted only one day a week to all the Atlantis projects combined. Effective day-to-day -day management was performed by others. Travers? Someone with conventional, statist, attitudes, and morals, it's much less dangerous doing a routine job in a conventional, law-abiding bank than performing tasks requiring initiative and integrity in an enterprise which is probably operated in legal gray areas. But, from what I have heard, Travers is not just a status sheep, but a deliberate coercivist. Supposedly, he told others who worked for Atlantis, as a form of intimidation, that, when a rock music group which he was involved with failed to pay him to his satisfaction, he arranged for the FBI to bust them for drug possession. I do not at present have money in either at cops or bank of. Note from Rogue about Vanu, March 87. I read Vanu and How to Start Your Own Country, and neither sounded plausible. Vanu was a bit of a disappointment. The articles weren't very well developed. What would you do about medical problems if you are living in the woods, for example? Even if you could get to a hospital, you couldn't afford it. Why take such drastic measures to get away from the state? You could buy land and do the same thing, as long as you kept a low profile. You still have to pay taxes on your paychecks, keep your vehicle registration and license up to date. The benefits of sitting out in the woods by yourself, or even with a freemate, seem minimal, unless you don't like people. I think Rayo may have simply been justifying his need to live alone. The book was more a tribute to the man than a real guide to Vanu. Comments for Rogue from Jim Stum I agree with a lot of what you say about Vanu. I've expressed similar criticisms myself, but let me say a few words here in defense. Remember that Rayo did live a wilderness Vanu lifestyle from 1968 to 74 and possibly beyond so he's not just some impractical dreamer. As for medical care, some people who are young and healthy see this as being of little importance. Maybe they get first aid books like How to Be Your Own Wilderness Doctor by Bradford Angier and rely on self-medication. Actually, someone living in the woods in USA, if he has a vehicle, may be as close to medical care as any rural resident. It's not like he's in a log cabin in the high Arctic or on a small sailboat in mid-ocean, though there are people in such places too. Is their lifestyle implausible? Cutting oneself off from medical care is the calculated risk some people are willing to take. A Vanuan need not necessarily be impoverished. He might have money from savings or income from investment, or from some location-independent occupation, e.g. writing, that he works on at his wilderness home. Tristan Jones mentions writing some stories to sell while crossing the ocean in a one-man sailboat. The Vanuan might even carry medical insurance if he can afford it. Why not? On the other hand, just because someone lives in a city doesn't guarantee that he can afford medical care. I would say that Rayo was mostly describing, not justifying the lifestyle that appealed to him. His main error was to assume that some one way of life was best for everyone. You seem to make the same mistake, suggesting that buying a remote homestead is the best way. By contrast, the point that I always stress is that people differ. There is no one best way for everyone. Find the one way that suits you best, and do that, and never mind if other people prefer to live differently.
Last Letters from Rayo June, 1973 Yes, all our mail should now go to Berkeley. So far as I know, there hasn't been problems with the cave junction box since last autumn, but we prefer to have an address out of the region. Besides, the CJ box is no longer ours and relaying mail has proven somewhat of a problem. The impression I had of Vanu Life when Land first announced the split was that Vanu Life would be a reprint of the best things from Vanu Link. I was responsible for BCWCS being listed as source for the catalog. Land said this address was listed by AA Directory and asked if I knew which address was latest. Since you had done more for VL than CAT staff and since their address might be no longer good, likely if catalog no longer being published, I recommend your address. I thought BCWCS would appreciate the business, if any. I didn't think about the possible connection. Sorry. I find it hard to believe that Bludge are busily correlating that kind of clerical flotsam, though. But it might be a good idea to introduce some deliberate misleading clues just in case. After encouraging competition, if thousands of urban Vanuans flock to as a result of the article and look for temporary jobs, unlikely I suspect, the result will be to lower wage rates some. This will cause, one, people for whom has no particular attraction to go elsewhere. Two, some employers to shift some of their tasks to temporary help. Three, some companies to locate in who would otherwise go elsewhere. Net result, wage rates only slightly lower, plus thousands more urban Vanuans busily trying to do many kinds of alternative enterprise things, opening many new possibilities. If the particular line of work you are in is especially lucrative, due to stiction in the labor market, inertia, slowness of information travel, you can expect increasing competition, which will bring your wages down whether or not you communicate about it. The only effect of communicating will be to speed up the change and cause more of the competition to be your acquaintances. Later that winter, we did cross that particular creek in fairly high water by previously rigging line. I find I now tend to be more careful and conservative about natural hazard than when I was a weekend recreationist. This was demonstrated to me this winter when I crossed that same creek without a rope but using a staff carrying a backpack. Water was fairly high. I had feared that if I ever slipped and fell, the increased water resistance would sweep me away. Well, the worst happened. Both feet slipped at once and down I went, and simply sat there. My heavy backpack probably helped anchor me, dense load. I'm probably more conservative because of unavailability of medical aid, also because there is no status game element of being daring. I find I'm reluctant to delve into theoretical questions in strictly personal letters, preferring to write articles for wider circulation. This seems like more efficient communication, but I'm not sure what it is. Your thoughts on ontogeny phylogeny are interesting. My own thoughts on this aren't coherent yet, but the emotional reactions I had while writing Rooting Out the Outposts article in Vanu Life 1973 support your hypothesis. On one hand, I had strong qualms about the article. On the other hand, I felt strongly enough that VL should include such an article that it be definitely published, charged against my advertising allotment if necessary, which I reserved for myself when I parted with VL. This was probably unnecessary. Land was short of material and kept soliciting more articles. My feeling was that I didn't want VL to help clutter up the woods with status clods. I didn't think the article would lead to the conversion of very many people, but that it would cause status readers to turn off to Wilderness Vanu if they were not turned off for other reasons, which seems more likely. So my article was an attempt to telescope movementism and Vanuism. I'll be interested in any reactions as to how well it succeeded. Problem. It's hard to learn about the th doings of statists and not be morally indignant. They shouldn't be allowed to do those things. It's not right, etc. Roberta and I discussed one hypothesis. Humans have spent most of their evolutionary experience in small groups where such a response is constructive. A coercer can be kicked out of the tribe, 
even if he is bigger, stronger, quicker, and more popular, he can probably be done in by ambush. Problem arises when this emotional capacity, evolved for small group situation, is applied to nation, where it is non-constructive. Movements who get hung up on moral indignation not only are non-constructive, often destructive, themselves, but interpret any contrary response, vanu, as a cop-out. In order for a movementist to become effective, he must redirect the moral indignation. I think the indignation itself is desirable, may be necessary. I feel a large amount of indignation, but it is necessary to sublimate it somehow, to learn, not only intellectually, but down to the emotional level, that America is not ye old tribe, and that a response appropriate in the latter is futile in the former. I never especially liked the word freemate, but Roberta says she likes it, better than any other term she has heard, so do I, partly for lack of role-playing element. We grabbed on it when we wrote our free marriage contract, another term I don't especially like, because we couldn't think of anything better. I don't think I could play a bludge convincingly, and I'd hesitate to try, but suggestion is a good one. Having a fortnight instead of a week will allow starting off in a camp already set up, then people explore area, scout sites, discuss, scout some more, select site, move camp, then I try to find, and I have a camp for them to try and find. A continuing hide-and-seek game. This not a put-down of your suggestion. Nor is it to imply there must be something wrong with someone who could play a bludge convincingly. I'm simply not a good actor. September 14th, 1973 My thinking has undergone major changes in the last several months on interfacing, alternate economies, interrelations in general. Perhaps I am coming to the same conclusions you have, though I'm not sure what yours are. I will probably write an article on subject when my thoughts become further crystallized. The only person I've had good, deep, ongoing theoretical discussions with is Roberta, because she is the only person I'm around enough to facilitate such discussions. Often, though, replies, thoughts, and answers will occur to me, not at the time of a conversation, but sometime later when I'm off by myself, similar to what you say happens with you, so I don't think one or a few intense concentrated discussion sessions can provide the same opportunity as an ongoing association. Several times we have visited and had long discussions with people who write theoretical articles, but the face-to-face -face was invariably limited to nuts and bolts. Berkeley address is still good. February 14th, 1974. I am now more eager to sell the 600 pound stash we have near Bella Coola. The woman who owns the farm on which they are stored is considering selling. There is no big hurry, but I would like to dispose of the supplies by next summer at the latest. Also, the chance that we will use them grows less. We would enjoy making another trip to that area, and the supplies give us a good excuse, but we have many projects we could better spend time on. Your November 3rd letter, which we didn't get until a few weeks ago, because of misunderstandings with people receiving our mail, contained many interesting thoughts as usual. We withdrew from ATCOPS even before you did. Irrelevant. My suggestion was to get out of ATCOPS, not out of silver. Without going to unconventional lengths, you could have bought bullion or coins from a local dealer and stored in a rented safety deposit box, for example. If you had asked what my recommendation would be if the only feasible alternatives were at cops and a conventional savings account, my choice might have been different. Again, I didn't recommend against or for a particular form of investment. I passed along info I had received that at cops's promoter was unreliable. I received a large manuscript detailing one person's experiences at at cops. It is loaned out at the moment. I'll mail it to you when I get it back. The last thing I recall writing on preserving savings was in Vanu Life No. 6, page 8, was buying and storing silver coins. I, too, am becoming very dubious as to the value of all Libertarian Club involvements, perhaps even more dubious than you. I still see some value for me in the kind of anonymous ideological and intellectual exchange which goes on in Libertarian Connection, 
but we do not intend to use the Libertarian Club in the future as an avenue for gaining non-anonymous friends or associates. Many more thoughts, but not articulatable, yet. Editor's Note I believe the manuscript critical of Atkoff's mentioned above was the one written by Pyro Egon, which I also received on loan, read, and returned since this February 74 letter was received. As far as I have been able to discover, no one has heard another word from or about Rayo. Liberated Lifestyles by Jim Stum February 1984 Self-liberation techniques fall into two categories, limited and comprehensive. Limited tactics provide some increase in freedom in particular areas of one's life for the person who employs them, e.g. using tax loopholes or using a mail drop. Such tactics don't cost much, and they can be used by a person living a mostly conventional lifestyle, but their benefits are similarly limited. At the other extreme, there are a few comprehensive self-liberation strategies that can provide a large increase in freedom across most areas of one's life. The cost of these strategies is proportionately high, usually requiring adopting an unconventional lifestyle. We advocate no particular path towards freedom, but rather we are interested in any approach that works. It's up for you to decide which ideas you want to implement yourself. All of the comprehensive self-liberation strategies that I know about, the ones that are really feasible today, ones that some people are already practicing, fall under these six headings. Live in a camper. Be sea mobile. Be internationally mobile. Hide out in the wilderness. Practice urban anonymity. Live on a self-sufficient homestead. I will briefly explain what each of these entails and give some references for further information. The cost and benefits of these strategies are discussed in the references mentioned. Two particular sources of information that cover many of these strategies are the books. Last Frontiers on Earth, LFOE, and VANU, The Search for Personal Freedom, VANU. 1. Live in a camper. Live in a motorhome, converted bus, camper on a pickup truck, delivery van, etc. Park at hidden spots in the wilderness, at established campgrounds, on city streets, supermarket or shopping mall parking lots, or a friend's city driveway or country acreage. Stay no longer than a month or two in one area. Give no forwarding address, pay cash, use aliases, and use other similar tactics to develop anonymity. References See Newsletters, Preform, Inform, and Vanu Life, and see Chapter 15 of LFOE. 2. Be Sea Mobile Live on a small sailboat. Make long ocean passages traveling from fort port to port, or visit uninhabited islands, tropical atolls, or remote coves on unpopulated coasts, staying some weeks or months in each place, or hang around one rugged, lightly populated coastal area, e.g. British Columbia, that has myriad islands and inlets to choose from. Be highly self-reliant, live off the sea, perhaps smuggle. More difficult or less desirable variations. Develop a permanent home on an uninhabited island, or live on a houseboat on an island waterway, bayou, swamp, river, lake. References See the newsletter Ocean Freedom slash Ocean Living and the Water Power Issue of Innovator, SU69, and see Ocean Freedom Notes, reprinted from Living Free. The five chapters of LFOE making up Part 2 discuss variations of this idea, some feasible now, some that may become feasible in the future, and see Sailing the Farm by Ken Newmeyer. Available from Loom Panics Unlimited. 3. Be internationally mobile. Be a multinational person. Pick the best features from a number of nations. Be a citizen of one nation. Earn income in another. Live in others. Bank somewhere else, etc. Make creative use of offshore tax havens. Live in hotels or rented apartments or villas. 
travel, usually by air, from city to city, continent to continent. This strategy is easier to pull off if you are affluent or at least can appear to be. References See the newsletter, International Living, $18 a year monthly, from 824 East Baltimore Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21218. And see International Investing by Douglas R. Casey, which covers more than just investments, available from Loom Panics Unlimited. 4. Hide out in the wilderness. Adopt Rayo's Vanu strategy. Live in national forests, mountains, and other public wilderness areas. Be a nomad, traveling on foot, by canoe, on horseback, or whatever. Live in a tent, a remote shack, in a camper, or dig a hidden cave. Develop a handful of secret remote homes and ramble among them, perhaps moving with the seasons. References See the newsletter, Vanu Life, and the book, Vanu. 5. Practice Urban Anonymity Live in rented, furnished apartments or houses in a large city. Rent under an assumed name. Move every few months and give no forwarding addresses. Get mail at a mail drop, phone calls through an answering service. Use different names for different purposes and change names regularly. Work at various free market, black market jobs. Socialize away from home. References See Free Man in the Slave State by Alan Humble in Innovator, Autumn 1968 and see Confessions of a Variable Identity Person by Chameleon in Loom Panics 1988 Main Catalog. 6. Live on a Self-Sufficient Homestead Buy a few acres of rural land. Build a cabin or park a camper or an old delivery van on it to live in. Plant gardens, raise some animals, plant trees, but for your own use only. Don't engage in commercial agriculture, which is highly regulated business. Develop some small home business to provide a modest income. Deal in cash or barter whenever possible. Make and do as much as possible for yourself. This can also be done in a city to some extent, but with major limitations. References See Mother Earth News and numerous other magazines in the Back to the Land genre. Loom Panic sells many books with relevant information. Or, develop your own way. For clarity only, I have tried to distinguish between these strategies, but even so, you see considerable overlap. In reality, there's nothing wrong with that. The best course may be to pick and choose details from various strategies and put together a lifestyle that you like. And none of these need to be a lifelong commitment. It's not like joining a movement or taking a pledge. You might try different ways of living in sequence or changing seasonally. Anyway, the main idea is, it's your life, and you don't have to live it like every other Tom, Dick, and Harry unless that's what you prefer. Open your mind to consider what it is you really want to do. General References 1. Loom Panics Unlimited P.O.B. 1197, Port Townsend, Washington, 98368. Sells many hard-to-find books that relate to many of these strategies. Send $2 for a catalog. 2. See 16 Ways to Live Free, A Critical Evaluation, by Rayo, in Vanu Life, 1973, The Special Handbook Issue. 3. See Self-Liberation Ways. A Compilation and Evaluation by Rayo in Innovator, Spring, 1969. 4. See More Self-Liberation Ways by Rayo in Innovator, Autumn, 1969. 5. I can supply photocopies or reprints of any or all issues of the defunct newsletters mentioned here, including Preform, Vanu Life, Innovator, and Ocean Freedom. Tell me what you want, and I'll quote you a price. Write to Jim Stum, Box 29, Hyler Branch, Buffalo, New York, 14223.
You've just heard Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, Part 2, Letters from Rayo, narrated by Nick Irwin and published by Liberty Under Attack Publications. For more great books and audiobooks like this, please visit libertyunderattack.com or search for Liberty Under Attack Publications on Amazon.